Good morning, everyone. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind you that face coverings are required at all times while in the county building. And please keep your uh, face coverings on when you approach the microphone, uh, co covering your nose and mouth. Thank you. I will now call the uh, August 4th, uh, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors to order. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Supervisor Leopold? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. McPherson? Here. Chairman Caput? Here. Uh, we'll have a moment of silence and uh, prayer, and then we'll follow with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, please join me. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, Mr. Palacios, do we have any uh, late additions or changes? Yes, on the regular agenda, item number 12, there's additional materials. There's a revised packet page, a revised memo, packet pages 69, 73, 75, 76, and 77. There's also a re revised attachment F. There's an updated polygon map on packet page 117. On the consent agenda, item 24, there's a correction. The item should read, accept and file the 2021 revised county revised budget document be considered during budget hearings in August, schedule a public hearing on August 18, 2020, beginning at 1.30 p.m. or thereafter to consider amendments to the unified fee schedule and take related actions as recommended by the county administrative officer. There's additional materials, a revised memo, packet pages 651 and 654, attachment C, there's notice of the unified fee schedule public hearing, replacement packet page 672, and attachment D, revised budget hearing schedule, which is packet page 672 also. Thank you, that concludes the corrections. Okay, thank you. Uh, do any uh, board members uh, wish to pull any consent items to the regular agenda? I don't hear any. Uh, public comment. Uh. Uh, Chair, if we, if, if yes. I could just say something at the beginning of public comment. Uh, it is hard in these days of COVID uh, uh, to gather together, uh, but I wanted to share a proclamation uh, honoring Dave King uh, and proclaiming Dave King Day. Uh, whereas Dave King, a native of Del Norte, Colorado, was born on June 16, 1951, and at 18 years old moved to Santa Cruz where he became the beloved father of twin daughters, Brianna and Sean King, and proud grandfather of Nico Dior King, Grafina and Gianna Sophia King. And whereas Dave was a star varsity, varsity basketball player at Blackford High School and was offered a scholarship to UCLA, but his first love was surfing. And after attending West Valley Junior College in Saratoga, he followed his dream and moved to Santa Cruz. And whereas Dave was the king of heart and soul, 
who shone like a magnificent beacon, statuesque, tanned, deep voice, deep blue eyes, white curls, and a soul patch. And he was the quintessential California boy dedicated to his community, friends, and everyone he met on his travels. And whereas Dave was a man who was larger than life itself, beloved by an army of surfers, volleyball players, paddle boarders, so full of goodwill that his love and life would truly fill any space that he was in. And in addition, he was an ambassador, a true waterman, a graceful surfer, a pioneer of paddle boarding who himself became a monster paddler and a commanding presence on any sporting field. And whereas Dave, David was a mainstay in Ride a Wave Foundation since its inception in 1988, and believed that those in the program were the kind of people he wanted to surround himself with, and that he was meant to help others surf and enjoy their lives in healthy ways. And the Ride Away kids loved him, and they would light up and when he strolled across the beach towards them. And whereas Dave, David dedicated his life to others, but no one took the place of his daughters that he loved madly, and he always said that there were never words powerful enough to describe the love that he, they had for each other. And whereas on July 3rd, 2020, David passed away just before five in the morning in the comfort of his home, surrounded by his loved ones, beautiful flowers, flowers and a paddle in his hand. After all, it was the Dawn Patroller's favorite time of day. Now, therefore, I, John Leopold, Santa Cruz uh, First District Supervisor, hereby proclaim June 16th at David King Day in Santa Cruz County and urge all citizens to join in the annual celebration of his life to honor, love, and remember the loss of a gentle giant, of a man who was always more comfortable serving his community than shining in the spotlight at his own paddle out, which will happen on August 8th, 2020 at Cal's Beach in Santa Cruz. We have a couple of representatives to, to acknowledge this incredible human being and a real loss to our community. I'm gonna bring you the... Uh, Proclamation. I take your hand, but I can't do that. All right, thank you, John. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Boots McGee, very good friend of uh, Dave King. I'm very proud and equally sad that I'm here to present a Santa Cruz City proclamation for my longtime friend, Dave King. The list of common interests we've all shared with Dave is as deep as the ocean and is much taller than his height. In fact, I've always looked up to him, <laughs> and I know he's never looked down on anyone. His place in the community filled so many important needs to young and old. Inspiration, engaging, and fitness was what he exuded. It's no wonder he's loved and missed. For a decade, I was the official photographer for the Ride Away Foundation established by Danny Cortazzo. Ride Away allows kids and adults with a variety of physical and mental challenges to not only experience the beach and near shore waters, but also the ultimate surfing. What I photographed was not just the kids having the best day of their lives, but I also focused on the parents watching their child's experience, what many of us have done for half a century. There were dozens of times where I'd view my pics on the computer and tears would well up. Invariably, David would be in the very best frames. A big man at 6'7", he, also, he also had a voice that bellowed and reverberated gently in your ears. You always knew he was within earshot. Here he'd be helping a two foot six inch child with unimaginable challenges into or out of a kayak or carrying a little girl with burn injuries through the Rambo relay maze with the mom cheering her on. Dave was all that and more. He's been quite generous with not only just his, with just his time, but he's been known to assist with funds as he did with my family right after the Katrina hurricane. A year ago, February, <clears throat> a famed photojournalist contacted me about a project he created. He asked me to assemble a group of ocean enthusiasts for a senior athlete photo essay. My very first phone call was to David. Turns out a picture of Dave was chosen for the gallery at the Ringling Museum in, in Florida. I'm extremely proud to appear in that photograph also. One month after the shoot, he suffered his first strokes. I have to tell you, there are many of us in the lineup, men and women, who speak of him 
often and at times in total disbelief that someone like David King has left us. There's a local saying, live like Jay. Today, my shout out is be the benevolent king. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say rest in peace, Dave. I want to thank John Leopold for doing this today. I want to thank Angela Chestnut for helping me write the proclamation. And, and uh, I just uh, want to thank you, thank you all here today. And once again, my good friend, Dave King, rest in peace. Thank you. Good morning, thank you. My deepest condolences to David King's family. Um, first of all, I wanted to start out asking um, the supervisors, um, what are the larger issues facing Santa Cruz County? What are the larger issues facing Santa Cruz County? Um, crime, homelessness, um, that was evidenced um, with the Camp Ross and as we've had you know, local conversations relocating um, the homeless youth to the Seventh-day Adventist campground in Soquel, which is where I live. Um, illegal drug use is a very large um, issue for our county to be considering. Men mental health. Um, all these things really go together, um, and they're very um, large issues that we should all be very carefully considering, and we should pl be placing our time, attention, and resources toward these big issues. So given that the county has these issues that need to be addressed, why is the board taking time to criminalize non-criminals? I'm here to ask you to vote no on item 10 on the ag agenda today. Um, I think you all know um, item 10 would criminalize non-criminals by fining people who do not comply with the um, health orders. Um, I don't understand. Um, why spend your time and the county's preci precious resources even considering this? Um, the people of this county deserve better. Um, we pay our taxes on time. We raise our children. I have children. Um, we go to work. We have businesses. Um, there are lots of local businesses struggling. Supervisor friend um, Nicole um, Duke is in your district. She has hot, hot yoga and aptos. There's a GoFundMe account for her right now, for her business. Um, we all deserve better. Um, I don't understand why we're wanting to criminalize the non-criminal. Our governor is releasing convicts. If mask worked, put the mask on the convicts, keep them in prison. Um, there's no reason, there's no, there's no reason to punish the people, okay? Everybody's doing the best they can. There's no need to criminalize this vote no on item 10 on the agenda. And I wanna go one step further. And until our, our county is fully open again, you guys need to seriously consider um, foregoing your pay. And I think Gail Newell needs to also. <laughs> there are bus people are losing their jobs and businesses. Okay, and so either donate the, your salary to these GoFundMe accounts or forego your salary. Thank you. My name is David Hara. I live in Santa Cruz County. Now here are some questions while I await the end of the COVID-19 episode. Why do we wear masks in the hope that it will prevent the spread of COVID-19 when there are no peer-reviewed, double-blind studies to prove they are effective. Yes, masks stop spittle, but the overall probability of that spittle containing COVID-19 is less than 0.5%. Why did Anthony Fauci and the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control initially say not to wear masks? Why do we wear masks when they are known to be detrimental to our health? And if not worn correctly, are more likely to make us sick, as reported by Surgeon General Jerome Adams on March 31st of this year. Why do doctors lose their jobs or lose their medical licenses and or receive death threats after telling their stories about how in their medical practice, their use of HCQ, plus the ZPAC, plus zinc, are 96% effective in overcoming 
the COVID-19 disease, as reported by Dr. Simone Gold and Dr. Harvey Risch and others in the mainstream media. Why does Dr. Fauci prefer the therapeutic drug remdesivir made by Gilead Sciences, which cost about $2,340 for a five-day course and is only 60% effective, as reported by CNN on June 29th of this year? How much money has Governor Newsom promised to send to Santa Cruz County so Gail Newell would keep us on lockdown due to more cases of COVID-19. The fact of the aforesaid, why did the Rockefeller Foundation publish in 2010 the scenario for futures of technology and international development that foretells almost exactly what has unfolded under the current COVID-19 situation, including the accidental release of COVID-19 from the Wuhan lab, wearing face masks, social distancing, quarantine lockdowns, and business closures. The fact that the aforesaid article was published 10 years ago proves that the current COVID-19 episode was planned 10 years ago and is now being carried out. The residents of Santa Cruz County are waking up to these questions, along with the residents all across the United States. And the voters of Santa Cruz County will not vote for you if you continue to acquiesce to all such fraudulent COVID-19. And we will not vote for you if you order a mandatory mask for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, I got some good news for you today. Uh, we can declare victory over Corona-19. On July 27th, 2020 in Washington, D.C., doctors announced at a press conference that they now have a successful treatment for COVID-19 that is almost 100% effective. One doctor presented her case studies of over 350 patients with COVID-19 that she treated with hydroxychloroquine plus zinc plus zithromax. She had no deaths. All her patients recovered. The doctor said, quote, 64 studies worldwide prove hydroxychloroquine is effective. There is no need to continue the lockdown, social distancing and use of masks. There is no need to wait for a vaccine. Nobody needs to die, unquote. The day after the doctor's press conference, the propaganda attack dogs of big pharma and the drug companies were unleashed on the doctor's their press conference on social media was taken down by Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And their webpage was also removed. The doctors have been slandered, defamed, and attacked as conspiracy theorists for, for curing their patients and telling the truth. One doctor was fired from her job at the hospital she worked at. The evidence is staring us in the face that our medical system, government, mainstream media, and social media platforms have been taken over by those who put their profits before we the people. We are now at a crit critical juncture in the human experience where our entire society and way of life is being attacked, destroyed, and replaced for ulterior, ulterior motives and goals. The present pandemic is one method of using fear, ignorance, and confusion to manipulate people into doing things to themselves and each other that would have been unthinkable only a, year, a, a half a year earlier. We were, we were caught off guard when this alleged world pandemic was brought forth on the global stage by ignorance and fear. But now we have sufficient sound data from many diverse sources that will give us the opportunity to see what is really going on. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dave Willis. I just wanted to say um, thanks a lot for you all saving my life. I mean, it's like, I personally might not want to be here, but you made it possible for me to be here by the decisions that you made when you made your health decisions. I mean, all of you, like the lady doctor, um, you all, you gave your best judgment and you let us know what to do, take safety measures. So I wanted to come and say thanks a whole lot for saving all of our lives even though 
the people who come who complain, you save them also. You saved us all. Thanks a lot. I know it's not your fault that this pandemic is here. This started in Washington. People talking about uh, you all cut your pay. I, I'll be thinking that too as far as legislators. Why are they still getting paid and they doing a terrible job? People were in crisis and they going on vacation. They call it a recess, a month long paid. Why do we still pay them? They, not, they need not to be paid. They're not suffering like we are. So my view, I say, I think of you all in my heart and in my head and my thoughts, you all are heroes. All these medical people who made these decisions, you are heroes. You're not doing nothing wrong. You're saving us all. You're, you're, I can't hardly talk. I'm trying to say something, and I hope you get the message. They told us that you all were deciding for us to wear masks. I was like, huh, that's not going to work. But I decided to do it anyway. We Americans, that's what we do. We fight. We stand up. I feel like it's my obligation. I'm in the war. I'm in the battle. And I'm proud about, I'm doing my part. What you say do. I'm still alive because I do stay in. Driving me crazy, yeah, whatever. But I'm doing my part to win this fight. And I want to say thanks to you all because I'm telling you, you did the right thing. And I'm knowing I hold no ill will toward none of you all. I think you are great, good people. You are leaders. And you deserve, all deserve parades for this title, that title. All I can say is thanks a lot. You've saved us all. I don't know what to say. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just a reminder, if you're going to speak on uh, item number 10 about masks right now, uh, then you will not be able to speak uh, on the item when it comes up. Uh, this is the time for if you can't stay and uh, you, you want to make your point about item number, number 10, which is the mask ordinance. Uh, you can do that now, uh, but uh, you can't speak twice on the same topic. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm sorry. Good morning. My name is Olivia Martinez. I'm the Region 2 Director for SEIE Local 521. We are the largest bargaining unit for the County of Santa Cruz. We represent approximately 1,500 members. And I'm here to say that we are very angry. We are beyond furious with how the furloughs, with how the elimination of positions has been handled by the county. 30 of our members will be losing their job potentially during a pandemic. Many of these workers are people of color, the majority, and women that will be losing their jobs. Many of them have been here for over 20 years and did not expect to lose their job during a pandemic. We are concerned, we are also very angry with the Sheriff's Department for not abiding by the labor rules and not giving us the sufficient information and notice that they were gonna be contracting out food services and eliminating nine positions, the majority of them people of color and women in those positions. We are angry with the communication that department directors have done to our members. They have not done proper communication. It's been chaotic. At some points, there has not been any communications. We are angry that they have stopped the contact tracing in South County. That is huge where the majority of our cases are there and where the majority are people of color. So we will be back on the 18th, and what we're asking the board is to please review the budget carefully because we don't feel that these layoffs and these furloughs have, are, have been equitable, like Carlos has been wanting them to be equitable. It would be nice for Carlos to see me as I'm speaking, 
but you're not, right? So it seems like you don't care. It would be respectful of you to see me as I'm speaking about this. I am the largest, we are the largest union, and you are not seeing me when I'm speaking. So it's really disrespectful. So I think, thank you for listening to me, but we will be back. And I hope you take our matter serious about how these furloughs, how the elimination of these decisions have been communicating to our members. It has been unprofessional and it has been inhumane to treat workers who are the essential and the heart of soul of this community in this way. So thank you. All right, so I would just like to start by saying my name is Benton Scott Freedom. I run the Soquel Creek Restoration Project in the Soquel Hills, and I am doing that for the last five years. Prior to that, I worked in Western Medicine Healthcare, and I could not um, second what that man said prior about thanking you and your guys' health laws for keeping me safe. That is absolute hogwash. Anybody who knows anything about health knows that health does not come from these stupid little clown fare we wear on our face. Health is internal, health is intrinsic to people who get their sunshine, to people who live healthy lives, who go to sleep at the right time, who practice holistic health. Those are the people who don't get ill. I actually haven't been ill in over 10 years now because I've been adhering to holistic health and making sure my vitamin D is adequate so that I don't get sick when everyone else does. And again, what that guy said earlier about how you guys are all giving great advice to keep us all safe. I haven't seen any good advice come from any healthcare professional on the mainstream media, from any government official. I haven't heard anyone talk about vitamin D. African Americans and people of color are being affected by this disproportionately, just like they're being affected by all health ills disproportionately because they don't any longer live at the equator and they don't get the sunshine required for their body to make the adequate levels of vitamin D to keep them healthy. And so instead of disseminating that information to our people of color, to our neighborhoods that actually do need that information because of the massive disparity of time that they would need to spend compared to us fair-skinned people to keep the same level of health. It's not being had. All that we're doing is arguing over these stupid mandates. People like me are trying to find out in what way does your guys' little fear-based ordinance trump the Constitution? How does it trump the Bill of Rights? Like freedom of speech is something that millions of Americans have fought and died for. And you guys are taking that away because you guys are scared of germs. I'm in the healthcare professional, and I would like to tell you that one fifth of all common colds are the coronavirus. And so if you guys think that we're ever gonna eliminate the coronavirus, you guys are beyond nuts. It's never going away. Only thing that we can do is raise our health so that we can get over this and get to a place of herd immunity like Sweden is at now. And so I just, I just wanted to really say that everything you guys are doing makes me as an American incredibly shamed, ashamed to be an American because this is not the country that we live in. Our founding fathers did not say, give me safety or give me death. They said, give me freedom or give me death. And that's what we need is our freedoms back. Personal responsibility is not dead. If you want to live in a bubble and never go out, never experience germs, pretend that you don't have your own germs, do it. But that's nothing to do with me, it has nothing to do with my mom, it has nothing to do with my deaf aunt who hasn't been able to communicate with a single person throughout this entire epidemic because she reads lips. So this is actually muting her. And so I just wanted to say to all you guys, look you dead in your eye. I am ashamed of each and every Thank one you. of you to the extent to which you contribute to this unlawful. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Excuse That's me. it. That's it. Excuse me. Thank excuse you. me. You're you're done. Thank you. Excuse me. Your time is up. Your time is up. Thank you. For the building, and that's it. So now I'm leaving the building, and I don't want to wear your stupid mask. Good. Excuse me, Chair Caput. Before we continue, Chair Caput. Yes. Um, we're having a little technical issue and the meeting is not streaming live. IT will need to shut down and restart, which will take just a couple minutes. I streamed it live. Don't worry. Well, we'll, we'll let it go for uh, a few more speakers and then we'll... Um, it's not streaming on the internet, so no one can see this right now unless we shut down and restart. Okay, uh, you're talking about uh, the mask... Uh... No, no, I'm no, talking about asking for like a five or 10. Yes. Can we have a, like a five minute recess for a technical issue to fix a technical issue? Do we need a recess now.
Okay, five minutes, okay. Okay. We'll have a five minute recess. for the wait. Uh, chairman, supervisors, especially the people, um, people on that, the other side of this uh, podium, I think should be wearing masks because uh, I think it's outrageous. And um, this whole thing is to take down uh, the United States. It was the founder, Marie Strong, a billionaire. And uh, at the Rio conference, it set forth Agenda 21, which you fully endorsed. He suggested in West Magazine, I encourage you to look it up, uh, that he form a secret society uh, to pull down uh, Western industrial uh, states. That's exactly his word. Um, there's a Dr. Charles Lieber from, from Harvard who helped build the Wuhan Society. There's a 19-page affidavit by an undercover uh, FBI person. He was arrested along with uh, military uh, members and members of the Communist Party. Uh, that's not put out by our so-called local uh, newspapers, the Sentinel or anybody else. Um, we also have... Bruce McPherson, who's received tens of thousands of dollars from the Red Chinese. We find that WHO, a World Health Organization, is run by a, a wife of a Chinese Communist Party person. Uh, we have at the same time all the authority, uh, according to Mr. Palacios over here, uh, goes to a person that's being secretly paid by, by a secret billionaire by the foundation. And here's Mr. Palacios standing right next to Susan True on the Community Foundation. I believe he's involved in the illegal conspiracy. He put out a, a, a document uh, saying that Margaret Lopez had everything to do with what's going on here in this county. And of course, when I drive by a uh, Lassoud, which is everything in the county, she got Black Lives Matter. Both those founders admit that they're, they're trained activists and trained Marxists, and you know it. Bruce McPherson, uh, well, uh, uh, Zach Friend, both of his former employers now are registered lobbyists for the Chinese Communist Party. We find kill a cop, the violent, uh, not just the protesters, but those that are trained in the violence, the people responsible, according to a magazine that dedicated uh, their their interests in it. It says the group is indivisible, revolutionary communist party, the communist party of the USA, color of change and California forward. Well, it was our great uh, Leon Panetta, communist collaborator with the red Chinese, Hugh DeLacy, whose plaque is right out there on the courthouse steps dedicated to this communist that belonged to four different uh, spy rings, Perlow, Ware, Sorge, uh, Silvermaster. But California Forward, there Bruce McPherson's in it, Fred Keeley's in it. This whole county is designed to be taken down and the co-chairman of it uh, is Lenny Mendonca, advocates getting rid of 80% of the local governments. And that's what you've been up to. Thank, thank you. Hello, my name is Keith Dalton. I've been working in the trades, painting and carpentry work for at least 35 years. I'm 54 years old. There's a lot of carcinogenics that I work around by the state of California known to be, known to cause cancer. The mask is very hard to work under. I can't breathe. What I am trying to breathe is oxygen, whatever amount I can. I don't believe by wearing the mask I am going to live longer. I do not believe in the mask and I won't support it. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have been informed about the facts from OSHA about the safe and unsafe usage of this or any other part particle mask and the dangers and complications of the usage of this mask. This is a novelty. Doesn't make any sense to me. I say, get your knee off my face. Thank you. Thank you. Hello guys, my name is Laura Bezich. I'm a resident of Capitola for the last five years. Previously, I lived in five states, including Virginia, where I was born, New Hampshire, where I grew up, New York, Massachusetts, and Utah. I graduated from Syracuse University with a bachelor's degree in business and design before I moved to Santa Cruz to launch my startup company, a utility patented 
new consumer product. I've been an active participant in Santa Cruz Works, a member at the Idea Fab Labs, a participant in the big Santa Cruz pitch night, tech raising, and the Monterey Bay Startup Challenge, of which I was a finalist. This mask mandate will effectively turn me into a you criminal. You have to wear your mask. You have to wear your mask. Because I refuse to comply with an unconstitutional law that does not make sense, that is not justifiable, that is full of contradictions and holes, that destroys my uniqueness, my individuality, my humanity, and symbolizes censorship and silence. This is about, this is about, not about our health and safety, but about giving up our power and sovereignty and ushering a new form of Marxism. And before you jump to the conclusion that I must be a right-wing Republican because I brought up collectivist agenda. I accompanied a Democratic political operative to Utah, boyfriend of mine, on a mission to challenge Republican Senator Orrin Hatch. At this point, I do not identify with any party. I am registered as no party. I identify as a free American and an entrepreneur. This mandate is an outrage, an insult to the founding principles of our country, which protect the rights of the individual and the minority from the passions of the majority. You will have to force me into a jail. Maybe a concentration camp is more likely in the plan. Before I will- Chair, we cannot have people in the building without, can you turn off the sound, please? Thank you. Chair. Thank you, so. Chair, uh, Chair Caput, Chair Caput. Yeah. Uh, we cannot continue to have these protests in the meeting. It's not safe for our staff. So if we continue to have people removing their mask, I'm gonna request that you clear the room. So if you could announce that, that we will clear the room unless people, if people continue to do these uh, protests. We're the only government that's continuing to have open meetings and we cannot do them if we, people are not going to wear their mask. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the remember, there's a lot of people that uh, don't want to go into a room where people are not wearing masks. Uh, there's so uh, uh, we have to understand that there's people that uh, find it uh, uh, offensive, really, that. Uh, uh, that nobody's respecting their health. Okay, thank you. People have different opinions based upon the sources of information, don't they? The real existential threats to life on the planet are the nuclear threat, the possibility of nuclear war, the nuclear arms industry, the environmental collapse and devastation of the ecosystems that support life on earth. And I heard, and also that uh, we don't really have a democracy. We're told we do, but with these authoritarian, somebody used the phrase, uh, tiptoe totalitarianism, uh, step by step, we're driven into compliance. I have a couple of questions and I've been on this planet quite a while. Would the government or corporations ever lie to us? Is there a history of that? <laughs> Another question, is the bioengineered coronavirus purposefully propagated in order to further facilitate the global military 5G deployment worldwide on Earth and in space. Because as we are here, satellites, 5G satellites are going up. A missile was just launched by the military from Vandenberg Air Force Base this morning. And there's a quote here from the film, 5G Apocalypse, Extinction Event. 
it's important to understand what the 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told on the IEEE beam forming document that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. These are assault frequencies. If you know nothing more than that, that's what you need to know. It's microwave radiation warfare. That's what it is. And a 4G Verizon cell tower just went up at ocean and water in the medium, soon to be 5G. This is the real serious threat that the county needs to be opposing this rollout. Um, the Board of Supervisors, that's the most serious threat in my understanding. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Good morning, my name is Gary Schofield. I've been living in the county now for 40 years. Uh, on the mask issue, by the way, the virus, the alleged virus is one billionth of a meter in size. And so in order for the masks to work, it'd have to be so tightly woven that we wouldn't be able to breathe. So it's really a sham. In terms of the death potential in Santa Cruz County with four deaths and 275, 275 citizens, you, we have a 0.00014% chance of dying from COVID, 0.0014 in the state of California. If you use the numbers, the alleged 9,224 deaths, we have a 0.00023% chance of dying. So in terms of Santa Cruz County, it's a non-event. At 0.0014, it's a non-event. It's not happening. But let, let me talk about some of the financial considerations. California has approximately 500,000 cases. And a case, by the way, let's define a case. A case is a positive test. It's not, it has nothing to do with disease. Most of the cases are asymptomatic. But we get, we have, we get, Newsom is getting $5,000 per case. With 500,000 cases, we're going to get $2.5 billion. Santa Cruz County has 1,115 alleged cases. Remember the PCR test. It has a 50% false positive. At, at, at 5,000 per case, the county will get $5.6 million. Santa Cruz County in 2009 had a $10, $10 billion GDP. So let's assume that that's still in, in effect, $10, $10 billion GDP for the county of Santa Cruz. Uh, so, so I'm wondering, does that five, we're gonna get $5.3 million from Mr. Newsom in terms of the COVID per case, but we're losing po po possibly 250 to $500 million in lost revenue from shutting down the economy. And I wanna ask you guys, it, does that make sense? Does that make sense from you? you? You guys are our representatives. You control the budget, you control the, the, the events that happen in the county. Does that make sense to you to lose anywhere from 250 to $575 million in return for $5 million from Newsom? Does that make any sense? So, so I'm wondering why it is that you're closing down our economy based on this a virus, alleged virus, and by the way, no one in the world has ever identified purify and sequence the virus. No one in the world has done that. Dr. Young has offered a $5 million reward for anybody who can prove an example of a virus that's been fully sequenced, purified, and identified. It, it, the virus is a theoretical construct. It's a theoretical construct. So, uh, well, I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. After this, we'll go to uh, we'll go to two minutes. Is that okay? What, what's going on? Okay. Good morning. My name is Ellie Black, and uh, last time I was here, I brought up the fact that it's completely reprehensible 
that half the people who attend these meetings in the room, in the hall outside, half the people are so terrified that they think that the other people around them could possibly kill them. That's how terrified they are. For those of you who were here last at the last meeting, remember there were a couple of altercations that took place out front where the sheriffs had to get involved and separate people, okay? The other half of the people are not afraid. We're hugging each other. We're not afraid. Is that because we're uneducated and haven't done our research? No, it's not. So I requested that our elected representatives and unelected representatives, as the case may be, set up a public health forum for the citizens of this county to learn some of the reasons why some of us are not afraid and offer an opportunity for the public to understand more about what's going on. To my knowledge, that has not been addressed or even considered. So that forces us to do it ourselves. So at this time, I would like to extend the invitation to each and every one of the supervisors and also Dr. Gail Newell to attend a health forum that will be a public event with questions and answers and several different people from across the health practitioner spectrum from our county to get into this in a way that the public can understand and stop acting in fear that maybe is not warranted. Or perhaps it will go the other direction. And those of us who have been hugging each other and not getting sick, many of my friends are over 60. Nobody has gotten sick in the entire time since February that this has been going on. Maybe we will learn something different and learn to be afraid. That could be the case. But either way, I'd like to extend that invitation. We do not have a date set yet. Emails will be going out with the invitation, but I'd like to publicly invite you now. And I hope you will attend. And I certainly hope Gail Newell will attend because we need her expertise on this. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Uh, I appreciate that we can all still stand here and speak publicly and that this is recorded and televised. I also appreciate that there has been some lenience with those who have, are not obeying the most simple rules. I'm not here to talk about the masks. Um, do a lot of research and a lot of study. I've been very blessed to live in this county since 1995. Um, last Monday, I found myself doing some research and homework and I was parked right in front of Twin Lakes. And unknown to me, there was some kind of kids camp. And so I witnessed at least 25 individuals or pairs of parents bring their small children to the beach and witnessed a, uh, another human being pointing a gun at these kids and just seeing these kids just go down, like what's going on? I can't believe what's going on. Now I'm not gonna take the time to go into the detail about how that affects you psychologically and physically, but it's really quite tremendous. And it's really sad to see that it is being suggestion, suggested that children be taught in such a way that is so unnatural. I mean, what has changed so much in the past six months that seems so different to how I was brought up? And I'm gonna focus on you know pointing a gun at another. So there's just a lot of stuff going on and I'll be speaking later, but I'm very happy about the lenience here about some people who are not respecting other people's ability to speak by what they're choosing to do. So hopefully I'll be able to speak on number 10. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Shirley Johnson. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist and I've had lots of courses like mac microbiology and uh, I also have a dental hygiene degree and I've taught school in this district for a number of years. Uh, my parents both go back to the Revolutionary War of 1776 and I'm a patriot. Uh, this pandemic is taking away our freedoms Keeping the China virus out with a mask is like trying to keep a mosquito out with a cyclone fence. It's ridiculous scientifically. It's a total joke. Um, masks are for control of the people, government control of the people. Yeah. 
This political shutdown is just a total farce, taking away our freedoms. And uh, I wanna say that talking about shutdown of the state of California, this state, if it was a country, would be the fifth largest economic country in the entire world. And it's all a political scam. I haven't been able to swim but one out of the last five minutes, months because they keep closing down things. I'm gonna try the cold ocean today. Hope I don't get washed out to sea. I've been in this county for over 50 years and this is just unheard of. I really think you guys should look into this idea of charging people if they aren't wearing masks. It's just out the window craziness. Thank you. Fascism. Good morning. I'm Jay Rosella Myers, and um, I am also a resident of the first district and have been incredibly supportive of the Board of Supervisors on many occasions about different issues. And I'm hoping that you can hear what we all have to say. There's a lot of really great information within this group. A lot of people have been looking into this for some time. Um, and I will leave you a copy with um, the, the, per, the clerk of an uh, article that appeared in Wise Traditions for the month of July, uh, Is Coronavirus Contagious? Written by Sal Sally F Fallon Morell. And she actually has a really good analysis and she's a pretty famous person who uh, wrote a nourishment um, cookbook and health uh, fanatic. But also I'm, I have copies of um, the Unruh Civil Rights Act that I want you to look over because there's things that appeal to our civil rights and the county health ordinance that I've highlighted things. I moved to Santa Cruz County because I used to live in LA County and uh, where I felt like I lived in a police state. I lived close to USC where I went to university and um, the helicopters, the <laughs> The flying helicopters looking for criminals every night were flying overhead, shining lights into our windows, and I felt like I lived in a police state. I moved to Santa Cruz County because I felt like there was justice for all here, for diversity and the love of this community and the wonderful aspects of enjoying this incredible environment. That was in middle 70s. And I cannot believe what's going on right now. I so appreciate that you're trying to do the best for us. Please continue. Thank you. Cove Britton, Matson Britton Architects, good morning. I'm here today representing a retired school teacher, but not just that retired school teacher, but this whole community that are looking for work or looking for jobs and are looking for an economy that can keep working. I was told by the county and repeatedly and insistently that this applicant had to pay for a application to determine whether they needed a soils report or not. Well, guess what? They had already submitted a soils report and it had already been accepted. And guess what? In the state of California, Every new house needs a soils report. Why in the world would the county insist that they needed to pay to determine whether they needed one or not? This has cost them tens of thousands of dollars. It has cost them months and months of time. It's shameful. Hi, I'm here to speak about homelessness. I'm homeless right now. Um, it wasn't planned for. It's not really something I chose. Um, right now they're doing, uh, creating a tent kind of area where we can live um, down on the green. And I think that it's great that we have support like um, showers and food 
and that sort of thing. Everybody is homeless for, there's a variety of reasons why people are homeless, but we sometimes seem to get lumped into the same category. I've heard a lot of people comment on how dirty homeless people are. And before I became homeless, I was also, when I saw trash lying around, I got depressed. Now that I've been homeless, I know it's not so easy to be clean. It's not, so, it's not easy to stay clean that um, people seem to harass homeless a lot. If you drop something, if you drop trash, I just wanna say that it's not easy. It's not easy to stay clean. It's not easy to hold all your belongings together. You know, when you see camps of people with trash around, that sort of thing, those people are actually trying to stay clean. But to someone who has a home, has access to water, has access to all those things, it just looks dirty to them. So a homeless person, they're tr they might be trying really hard to stay clean. So since people who have never been homeless don't know that, I just wanted to express that, to say, to say that to, to people. Um, the tents that they're putting up right now and the food and the, the showers are really helpful. And we're grateful for that. But I think a lot of people are worried about being clustered in. They're worried about the virus since everyone's kind of closer now. People were more spread out on the green. And the fence that they're putting up, I really, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that they're putting up a fence around the whole green area limiting our area. It looks like they're just trying to corral people into one area, and that looks like they don't care. It look, you know, I felt safe. I wasn't doing anything when I was out on the green. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for your patience. Um, I just wanted to let you know about the OSHA requirements and the OSHA standards, because you guys may be interested in that as well, as far as uh, respiratory protection goes. So the OSHA standard 29 CFR 1910.134, uh, paragraph D2 triple I of the respiratory protection standard considers any atmosphere with an oxygen level below 19.5% to be oxygen deficient and immediately dangerous to life and health. And that happens when you are behind a mask in less than five seconds. Uh, human beings must breathe oxygen to survive. And they begin to suffer adverse health effects when the oxygen level of their breathing air drops below 19.5%. Air the air is considered oxygen deficient. <clears throat> um, workers that are engaged in any form of exertion can rapidly become symptomatic as their tissues fail to obtain the oxygen necessary to function properly, they have increased breathing rest, rates, accelerated heartbeat, impaired thinking or coordination can occur more quickly in an oxygen deficient environment, which also includes bicycle riding and things like that in public. Um, this can be devastating to a worker if it occurs while the worker is performing potentially dangerous activity. Um, cons this also leads to tachycardia, impaired attention, thinking, and coordination, even in people who are resting. Uh, the rulemaking record of the respiratory protection standard clearly justifies adopting the requirement that air breathed by employees must have an oxygen content of at least 19.5, and that is not, does not happen when your face is covered with a mask. A lesser concentration of oxygen in the employee's breathing air is my time up? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that takes us to... Chair, we have two web comments. Oh, that's right, I'm, I'm sorry. The first comment is from Mark Masiti Miller. I urge support for this item being legislative item 9280 uh, in regards to public works uh, board of contract for the rail trail segment. I support, I urge support for this item. Completing these two segments of the rail trail will connect some of the 
um, densest, densest part of the county together with a car-free, safe, multi-use trail transforming the way folks, young and old, move around. Completing the rail trail will improve social equality, environmental sustainability, and economic vibrancy. Sooner is better. Thank you. Mark, 37 year resident of the county. The second item is from George Salva. This is in regards to the CARE Act funds for um, rental assistance and utility assistance. COPA strongly supports the directive to provide $1 million for rental assistance. My name is George Savala, a volunteer COPA leader with Holy Cross Catholic Parish. I am commenting on behalf of hundreds of families within our institutions that do not have technology access to be able to participate in the public comment process. I am joined by families from Live Oak and Soquel, along with other COPA leaders from St. Stephen's Temple, Temple Beth El, Resurrection Catholic Parish, Parish, St. John's and Calvary Episcopal Church. We have heard stories firsthand from these families about the financial impact they have endured during the pandemic. Many are in debt and owe rent money to, the, to their landlords, friends, and our financial institutions. Others have exhausted their savings. All are concerned for rent they owe or will owe for the month of August and September. The city of Santa Cruz was recently accepted I'm sorry, the city of Santa Cruz was recently accepting applications for an emergency rent assistant program for city residents. But many residents living in an unincorporated area like Live Oak and Emerald Bay apartments do not qualify. Some families have left the area and others barely working. The majority have shared that they have only worked three to four days a week with less than eight hours per day. Hotels, restaurants, and other employees are not in full operations and many house households have been affected by this drastic loss of income. We are in support of this item to assist families during the COVID-19 pandemic. We would also like to see the County of Santa Cruz create an ordin ordinance to allow county residents 12 months after the local emergency is lifted to pay back the rent they owe. Thank you and we look forward to working with you on these issues. Um, Hold on one second. Some other ones came in, but they aren't public. So that's it. Thank you. Is there anybody downstairs? No. Okay, we'll go. To, uh, do board members have any comments or additional direction for items on the consent agenda? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. There are just a couple items that I want to comment on. First on item number 22, I wanna thank the uh, probation department and the auditor controller treasurer tax collector office about the discharge of, uh, of these fines and fees and penalties uh, for these young juvenile offenders. Um, we, if we want people to turn their lives around, we have to give them the ability to be able to do that. And if kids have, have uh, shown their success at, at being rehabilitated, we shouldn't uh, saddle them with large amounts of fines. And so this is a good step forward. On item number 29, I wanna thank the Mobile and Manufactured Home Commission uh, for their work. These, uh, these bylaw uh, changes uh, help them hold special meetings when we fall into times like this. That, that commission is a very hardworking commission and has worked very hard uh, to make sure that they can continue to meet the needs of a mobile and manufactured home residents in Santa Cruz County during this pandemic. On item number 44, uh, I wanna uh, thank uh, Public Works for moving forward on uh, putting out this RFQ uh, for segments 10 and 11 of the rail trail. Uh, this is exciting public infrastructure uh, that we're moving forward on. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we will continue to be uh, on a uh, constant and steady march uh, to build this rail trail uh, throughout our county and to it so we can all enjoy this amazing uh, infrastructure. I also wanna thank Public Works on item number 46, which is the emergency repair on SoCal San Jose Road. Uh, that's a key uh, thorough way uh, for so many people. The last item I just wanna talk about is item 30. Um, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has affected us all in countless and profound ways. The necessary shelter in place order helped us save lives, but it already, but it also placed those living in already unaffordable areas at even greater risk 
uh, of losing their housing stability. Our board moved quickly to establish a rent an eviction moratorium that was adopted by the state judicial council, but it never made rent go away. Instead, it created an even greater debt uh, that will be difficult for many to overcome. The state has provided our county with funds from the CARES Act to meet the immediate needs of the pandemic. We know that the best way to eliminate homelessness is to help people avoid becoming homeless in the first place. We must prioritize support for the most vulnerable and those at risk of losing their housing with funds designed to meet their basic housing and utility needs. I urge the support of my colleagues to support my request for committing at least a million dollars of our CARE Act funds to supplement our other funding for housing support. Working now will help prevent a greater homelessness crisis down the road. We must do all we can to help working families of our community stay housed in our county during this COVID-19 pandemic and continuing thereafter. I hope you'll join me. And that's all. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Supervisor Fred. Uh... Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I just need to um, announce that I need to recuse myself actually from item 44, the rail item. I do have a personal material financial conflict because my home is within 500 feet of the rail corridor. So I'll need to recuse on item 44. Um, I would also like to uh, thank staff on items 42 and 43, which deal with library upgrades in the second district. Uh, item 42 deals with the La Selva Beach and the money that was raised from the friends of the La Selva Beach, which has done such an amazing job. But extra thanks really to Damon for his project management on these projects and especially uh, the Aptos Library project. I appreciate that we are uh, back on a schedule here, and I just wanted to thank Damon for, for all of his staff work to ensure that we're on that schedule uh, for incorporating the Aptos History Museum and just in general for his feedback that he's been receiving from the community and trying to incorporate everything in. Uh, we are doing a lot of stuff even during the pandemic, and I think that the libraries will be an important place, virtual or otherwise, for people to use in the coming uh, few years. So just uh, extra thanks to staff on that. And lastly, I appreciate the work that Public Works did on item 48 in regards to Cox Road. As we continue to build out of the storm damages and to actually have that come in under budget, uh, nothing wrong with that. But uh, the community out there is thankful for the continued work that uh, happens on storm damage. I know that it's a tough road right now in the construction world, but I appreciate Public Works' diligence on building ourselves out of the storm damage repair. Thank you, Chair. Supervisor Coonerty. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of comments to make. Um, first, on item number 30, I'm very supportive of the rental assistance. Um, we have a long way to go uh, as we navigate this pandemic, and uh, hopefully this takes some of the pressure off of working families uh, that are struggling to, to get by right now um, as we uh, uh, as uh, through the, the limits on different on work and have fought, may have fallen behind on rent and utilities. Um, hopefully this is a lifeline going forward. On item number 31, uh, Supervisor Friend and I uh, brought forward a letter to condemn uh, the proposal to exclude undocumented people from the census. Not only is it unconstitutional um, and a blatant uh, political move um, to reduce representation in um, urban areas and, and blue states, um, it's also just uh, continuing racism uh, by this president to uh, to have people be less than, even though the Constitution is very clear uh, that it's residents of of this country that get counted. Um, and then finally, uh, on item number thirty seven, uh, the Smart Path report, um, I want to appreciate the staff's efforts uh, to find housing for uh, the people who are vulnerable and uh, experiencing homelessness in our community, uh, especially prioritizing families with children so that we can reduce the trauma um, and give those kids an opportunity uh, to have stability uh, and safety. Um, the numbers are still far too low and um, the challenge, we need to start thinking outside the box and providing more case management, more housing navigation uh, and looking at um, other options because we're getting too few people into housing uh, in this county. And so um, we'll look at that in item number eight uh, coming up, uh, but I appreciate the, the efforts that have been made with Smart Path um, to, to prioritize families in our community. Thank you. Supervisor uh, McPherson. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do want to comment on a couple of things, uh, some of which already have been addressed. On item uh, number 30, the CARES Act funding, I want to uh, thank Supervisor Leopold for bringing this forward. Uh, we certainly need to do what we can to help uh, renters. Uh, we don't want to have them become homeless as they can, who can't pay their uh, rent now for some uh, reasons beyond their control. Uh, but I also want to make sure, and I, I, I know that uh, Supervisor Leopold and the rest of us who support this action, uh, just to ensure there's equity built in, how will we distribute the funds? I think a program of, of work of how we're going to implement this, how we might implement it, um, and how it'll be administered, uh, who would de determine the quali uh, and qualifies for support, and how much support uh, can they get? And I'd like to also have a better understanding of how this program fits into the larger strategy of how we're allocating our CARES Act funding some of which has already been allocated or is going to be. Um, so I, there's a fully supportive of it. I just want to, would like to have more um, details on how we're going to implement it and to assure equity uh, for those areas. And it, it reaches each of, our, uh, well, each of our districts throughout Santa Cruz County. And I, I'm sure that Supervisor Leopold, I know, and the rest of us feel the same way. Uh, but I just would like to, uh, I think the public will certainly want to have some uh, outlook of how we're going to administer this uh, in more detail. <clears throat> On item number uh, 37, I, I noticed the average, <clears throat> excuse me, number of days uh, from contact to refer referral, uh, then referral to securing ho housing <clears throat> is more than a year. Um, and that's a, that's a glaring problem in, in my estimation. And I know uh, the lack of appropriate housing supply is a major factor. We don't have much housing here in the county, but some questions I'd like to have answered. Um, are there any anticipated program adjustments to improve the outcomes based on the data that we've had now that we've collected over a year uh, for that period of time? Um, do we ever look outside of Santa Cruz County to see uh, or do we, when making these housing referrals? Um, how, we have a lot of people who commute and so forth. Um, I just wanted to get a better sense of that and uh, have a more dedicated uh, affordable housing is, I believe is, uh, we all believe is critical to reducing the homelessness. And uh, if there are any outreach going on uh, to the property owners whose rentals will be empty this fall uh, due to the UCSC staying online um, in an effort to get more of those property owners to take uh, six and eight uh, vouchers. Um, those are some of the questions that I have, <clears throat> uh, again, about implementation of these programs. I think it's important. And also, I'd like to thank Public Works as they continue their ongoing efforts to uh, make uh, transportation road repairs. Uh, now we have number 45 to Bear Creek Road, a, a major, major arterial from Santa Cruz County over to Santa Clara County that many uh, thousands use every day. Um, I, I appreciate their emergency work on that and uh, all the work that Public Works has been doing to continue their road improvement program uh, that dates back to the 2016-17 storms. Uh, and that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Cap, it, it, if you don't mind, I just wanted to add a comment uh, to Supervisor McPherson's uh, questions and support. Uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson and the rest of the board uh, I've been working with uh, county staff. Uh, I believe that during the budget hearings next week, uh, when we talk about the CARES Act, that there will be, uh, a, the program details will be available. Uh, it'll probably be using uh, some of the other uh, organizations that are helping out with rent assistance right now, such as the Community Action Board and uh, Families in Transition. But we'll have all that information available uh, when we uh, discuss this next week. Thank you. Uh, hold on this. We well, I'd be prepared to move the, uh, the consent agenda. Second. Second. Was that Supervisor Coonerty who yes. seconded? Okay, thank you. I'll do the roll call vote. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. Uh, now we'll move on to the regular agenda, starting with item number seven. 
public hearing to consider proposed uh, easement by condemnation uh, APN uh, 041-081-18, uh, 041-081-1904-1920, to support the Valencia Road 2017 storm damage repair project and adopt resolution of this necessity authorizing the county council to institute eminent domain uh, proceeding to obtain a possession of the required real property interests as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy cao okay thank you hi how are you Good, how are you? Good morning, Chair, uh, good board members. Uh, I'm Travis Carey, Director of Capital Projects, and I, uh, it's my pleasure to provide a brief uh, introduction this morning before the, the actual item. I want to introduce Kimberly Finley. She's our new Chief Real Property Agent in the Capital Projects Division. She's managing the real property section in the Department of Public Works. Um, we're very excited to have her on board. Kimberly started in January of this year, has already accomplished so much for us. It's, it's just really great to have her on board. Uh, she does have a law degree and a very diverse background um, in, in all kinds of uh, real estate um, matters. So it's, it's very exciting to have her here. Uh, most recently, she was a facilities manager for the state of Alaska. So those skills are really um, valuable for us. Um, Kimberly's responsibilities include managing the real property section in public works, uh, leasing and property management services countywide. Uh, she also does the road abandonments and surplus land sales and writes agreements to support capital projects, uh, construction projects for us, um, providing excellent support there as well. And also a lot of special projects these days, uh, currently uh, writing agreements and doing negotiations for the CAO, HSD and economic development projects. And most importantly, property acquisition. So we do a lot of property acquisition uh, through public works. A lot of those are for easements to support emergency road repairs. And sometimes those do require condemnation. And that's the uh, topic in front of you today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Kimberly Finley. I'm the Chief Rural Property Agent with the Department of Public Works. I appear before you today to request that the board conduct a public hearing on the proposed easement by condemnation across rural property located at Valencia Road, post mile 0 0.34, and to request that the board adopt a resolution of necessity authorizing county council to institute the eminent domain proceedings to obtain possession of the required rural property interests. To provide brief but relevant background, Public Works is requesting a resolution of necessity to proceed with the eminent domain process to obtain rights to 2,204 square feet of permanent roadway easement and 1,993 square feet of temporary construction easement, which easement runs across, across four contiguous parcels of land, all owned by one Mr. Dane Pefferell. Substantial time and county resources have been expended to attempt to contact Mr. Pefferell and offer just compensation for the taking of these required permanent and temporary easement rights. The real property section has attempted to reach Mr. Pefferell utilizing available county resources, internet search, the white pages, and via comprehensive background check performed by county council. Public Works has attempted numerous times to contact Mr. Pefferell via certified mail, telephone, and physical site visit. A condemnation notice providing notification of this public hearing was sent to Mr. Pefferell's last two known addresses via certified mail on June 15, 2020. Both of these letters have since been returned undeliverable. To date, the Department of Public Works has received no responsive communication from Mr. Pefferell. It is imperative that the county move forward at this time with acquiring the real property easement rights over Mr. Pefferell's land as the associated Valencia Road storm damage repair project is at risk of losing vital project funds if we do not pursue this action expeditiously. 
The Valencia Road Storm Damage Repair Project has been allocated $600,000 in Federal Highway Administration funds, which funds are at risk of lapsing if this project is not right-of-way certified by September 2020. This right-of-way certification is dependent on the county obtaining rights to the proposed easement. The Valencia Storm Damage Repair Project will restore the road damage caused by the 2016-2017 storm event. The current damage consists of an approximately 60-foot slipout, which encroaches approximately 10 feet into the road, resulting in the complete closure of one lane. Any further damage to this road would threaten the one remaining lane. Valencia Road at post mile 0.34 is a major collector road with a significant number of average daily trips, and it is a vital transportation link for this area of the county. This road must be repaired. Based on the aforementioned, I now request that the board conduct a public hearing on their proposed easement by condemnation across real property located at Valencia post mile 0.34 APNs 041-081-18, and 041-081-21, and adopt a resolution of necessity authorizing County Council to institute eminent domain proceedings to obtain possession of the required real property interests. Thank you, and I'm available for any questions. Very welcome. Uh, do we have any board members who have questions on the item? I don't hear any. So uh, uh, each person will open it up to the public on item number seven. I think and you want to say you want to open the public hearing. Well, yeah. I'll now open the public hearing on the item and uh, each person, anybody want to speak? We have one. Okay, you have three minutes, sir. Is that the item to which the lady just spoke? Yes. Yeah, Yeah. I, I used to live in the area, but I can't <clears throat> picture just which part of the Valencia Road it is. Could she mention some cross streets or intersections? <clears throat> We have an answer. It's located at post mile 0.34 and there is an exhibit A attached to today's agenda item that uh, describes the location. <clears throat> Any, uh, anybody downstairs wants to speak? No. No one in the community room. No web comments. Uh, that concludes public hearing for uh, item number seven. Bring it back to the board. I'll move the recommended time. action. And I'll second, and Chair, I'll just make a brief comment that I appreciate how the board has worked on this. It's a part of my student was the project that popped up on the estimate uh, property owned, so this has been mentioned. And today I'm going to move this update. Okay, uh, and uh, Mr. Friend, uh, I was, there's a little problem with uh, your microphone, maybe. No, it was okay. Maybe it's our problem here. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, is there a motion and a second? Yeah, uh, I'm, I made them first and uh, Supervisor yeah, Friend correct. made the second. That's correct, I'm sorry. And uh, the clerk will conduct the roll call. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chairman Caput? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. That takes us to item number eight, consider report, a report on COVID-19 public health emergency shelter and care response, an update on focus strategies, action planning, consider and approve Santa Cruz County six month work plan for homeless response, adopt resolution authorizing emergency solutions grant, uh, CV grant in a, an amount not to exceed $1,967,600 and direct staff to return no later 
the November 17th, 2020, with an updated report and take rela related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. All right, how you doing? Good morning, everyone. Okay, yeah. Okay, better. Good morning, everyone. Elisa Benson, Assistant County Administrative Officer, and I'm um, presenting today with Randy Morris, and he's gonna kick us off. Uh, good morning, board members, Chair Caput, um, and public listening. Uh, I'm Randy Morris. I'm the director of the Human Services Department, and I'm sitting here with Elisa Benson, actually wearing two hats. Uh, the first one is the Human Services Department is responsible to provide mass care and shelter during a disaster. And as I've had an opportunity to present to this board and public before, that is the work we're doing in the shelter uh, operation to help those experiencing homelessness and vulnerability. And we'll be speaking to some of our work again. But second is, um, this is sort of the beginning of uh, the transition of the office from Elisa's leadership in the county administrative office to my department, Human Services. Uh, as the county administrator asked of your board and your board approved, we'll be starting a new office in Human Services. So Elisa and I and our staff have been working together and sort of share this report as the beginning of this transition. Um, so I am going to share a little bit uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Elise is gonna kind of go through the middle of the presentation and I'll close this out. And please ask us questions anywhere along the way. This is a lot of information and I'll, we'll pause between each of our presentations in case you have questions. Um, what brings us in front of your board today uh, um, is really two items. One is there's been a number of requests of your board over the last many months for um, us to come back to you, us being both the work we're doing in human services and the homeless office uh, in Elisish. Um, operation. Uh, so we're here to kind of share those updates. And section, second is we do need to ask for your board to take action on a grant, which um, Elisa will speak to um, in more detail. Uh, the specific agenda, I'm gonna be giving an update on our work in COVID in the uh, shelter and care branch. A lot of services we've been providing as an update, which is some of the requests your board had of us to come back to you and talk about where we are. Um, then Elisa is gonna talk about a number of activities happening with our consultant group focus strategies and a lot of uh, work activity and some updates on both the six month uh, work plan, as well as a three year action plan that's under development. And then Elisa's presentation will finish with an update on the grant um, opportunity that um, I mentioned earlier. And then I'll close this out with um, summarizing what the recommendations are that we're asking of your board and uh, any questions. So uh, I would like to start by just sort of explaining to the public, um, if those don't know, um, the health office uh, has been holding a lot of um, press uh, briefings and a lot of presentations to the board about under a pandemic, the public health office initiates a number of very formal activities, including an incident command center to sort of figure out how to manage this pandemic. And as an extension of that, the human service office has opened up an incident command center as well. And we do all of our work in partnership with the health office to make sure we can do what we can as the shelter operation to help um, reduce the spread of COVID. So we actually have a formal incident action plan. And I actually wanna just um, remind the board and or share with the public um, what those objectives are that sort of ground the work we do in our shelter work. So there are three. One is we are to provide shelter and care, sometimes it's both, um, to the highest risk groups in our community, which is predominantly those experiencing homelessness and more. Um, second is to ensure that um, our shelter capacity is 24 seven so that we can ensure there's social distancing in those shelters uh, to comply with the shelter in uh, place order because that's much harder to do when you are somebody in shelter or are homeless. Um, and then last, to do all we can with the resources we have to increase our outreach during the pandemic to those experiencing homelessness so that we can sort of be in touch with them and see how we can help if, if possible. Um, so this is um, a, a report back on some of the activities and an update on some of our work in the shelter and care doc. And I'll end with some of the things that we're looking at uh, moving forward. Uh, before I begin, I do wanna um, take a moment to comment that this is a presentation from two uh, Santa Cruz County government offices, but we do our work in partnership with cities, uh, with volunteers, with disaster service workers and others from uh, county government and a number of nonprofit organizations. So this, uh, we, we have um, the pleasure of presenting kind of the work we're doing, but we includes a village of lots of uh, people. Um, so summary on some of the work we're doing in uh, uh, the shelter and care operation. Uh, first is we actually at this point have six shelter in place programs. Um, again, all of this is to help beat the spread of COVID. Um, 
I'm just gonna name that uh, three of them are actually sort of brick and mortar space where we've been able to expand shelter opportunities so that the shelters, which I'll speak about next, have opportunities to provide uh, social distancing. And those are uh, the Vets Hall in Watsonville, uh, the Vets Hall in Santa Cruz and the Armory. Um, fourth is in uh, one of the public comments uh, earlier today mentioned this, the transition age use trailers at the Seventh Day Adventist area, which uh, Supervisor Leopold's uh, office has been working on with neighbors. Um, and then we have two areas that were sort of unmanaged um, encampments that we brought in services to help and that's Coral Street and more recently the Benchlands. And I recognize there was a public comment from somebody earlier today who was there. So those six programs are um, efforts we've stood up. There's a lot of services and resources predominantly paid for by FEMA with food and um, a host of other um, uh, activities to try to help make sure people are safe and COVID is not spreading in those communities. Uh, next is we do have, as your board knows and the public likely knows, there are a number of shelters uh, in the community, but prior to COVID um, majority and uh, perhaps all uh, were not 24 seven. So we really took two actions forward and um, when COVID hit as part of our work and that was first to make sure that these shelters could be 24 seven. So people who were there sleeping overnight could stay so that they could shelter in place the entire time. Uh, second, which links to the first, uh, we made sure there was enough capacity elsewhere in the community so that people could uh, be socially distanced, which means there needed to be fewer people in the shelters. Um, and then there was also a whole host of other services brought in place, food um, and, and more. I do wanna uh, take an opportunity to just recognize the good work that's being done. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that this is being done within the human services uh, operation, but this particular work was work being done under Elisa's um, staff, Tatiana, who did the lion's share of work with uh, uh, all the shelter network. It was an incredible amount of work. So thank you, Tatiana, for your work there. Um, and then last, um, this has been getting a lot of statewide press, the Project Room Key program, uh, not only federal money, but some state match money to make it more affordable for local jurisdictions to be able to stand up um, hotels and lease hotel sites, to be able to provide isolation quarantine services for people who lack um, shelter. This was predominantly people experiencing homelessness, but also more recently people who are in overcrowded housing where they won't be able to um, safely shelter without spreading COVID in their, in their home. Um, there has been four uh, hotels that have been stood up, three in Santa Cruz and one in Watsonville. And we're in process of standing up a fifth and a sixth. The uh, fifth that's just up is in Santa Cruz and the sixth is in Watsonville. And the one in Watsonville that we anticipate will be stood up um, later this week, if not early next week, adds a uh, hundred beds. So a um, lot of work being done. Uh, the next status update is uh, care coordination services. Uh, I think this sort of coincidentally links to comments made by Supervisor Coonerty and McPherson on a different item, which is a, the Human Services Department's Smart Path program, which is this pre-existed before COVID. And that is, you know, what we can, can we do when we are helping people who are experiencing homelessness or in shelter to make sure that, that, that we're not just providing care there, but we're trying to connect them to the very limited affordable housing market. And that often takes a lot of support and wraparound and case management. So we've also brought in uh, care coordination services, which simply put was doing a review of those who are getting the services we provided and finding out if they're enrolled in and if not referring them to eligible services. And then I'll speak in a minute about the beginnings of piloting of some case management services to help supplement that. Um, the last item I wanna share about status update, um, I feel like I need to thread a needle here um, because I recognize as uh, county employees and a lot of public comments that were made about the privilege we have of having jobs and income um, to recognize that the work of our staff is getting quite overwhelming. Um, we have our regular day jobs. All of the work I just listed is a job on top of the regular day job. And this has been going on for months on end. Um, staffing challenges manifest in two forms. One is um, hiring extra help staff, which has really helped um, with the economy and people losing jobs to um, bring them into the system to be able to provide the services in the shelters and in the leased hotels. But the other is the infrastructure. And that is um, we're very strained with managing this work and everything I listed here. So everything we have to do to lift up the bench lands program behind this building and these extra shelters is a tremendous amount of administrative work and contracts and getting people on board. And so we have a number of staffing challenges that we're working on to try to get ahead of this so we can keep the work going ongoing. So I wanna end with a moving forward comment about our shelter and care work. 
Um, this first one is just such a difficult issue to manage, which is we are pretty good as a government system of planning, but how do you plan when there is so much uncertain in front of us? Um, we do not know what's gonna happen with the pandemic. I think uh, the last time or two ago when we were in front of the board, there was a request for us to look at demobilization and what to do now that the spread has plateaued and how are we gonna kind of help move beyond pandemic and now we're in a second surge. Uh, the funding is very, very unclear. Uh, most of the funding we have is state and federal funding. And if that funding dries up, how do we continue these services? How do we manage expectations? How do we talk to the community when that funding goes away, et cetera? Um, the next moving forward, uh, we are in the middle of, and I wanna give Elisa and her team the credit for all the work they've been doing the last month or two to try to lift this up before the transition happens to my office to get a case management program going. Um, we do not know and we will only know when we can get um, some more staff in place to go help people who are in these um, shelters and in these hotels to see how and in what we can do <laughs> to help them so that they are not just sitting there, but if there is an opportunity to, to move them to other housing arrangements, more permanent housing, that we do so. So we are close to being able to pilot a case management program, and we hope to be able to um, expand that and scale that over time, especially if this pandemic continues. So that's in process. Um, and the last is what I mentioned earlier. We are looking at a number of scenarios about how to increase our um, infrastructure to be able to deal with what could be many, many more months of this, given uh, the strain we're dealing with, because we can't sustain where we are. And that includes, we have not made any decisions, but we did just want to share publicly and with your board, the possibility of funding seems stable to actually have an RFP with some vendor contracts to help support some of the work we're doing so we don't continue to do it in-house. So this is a summary of the activities and I'm gonna um, pause there to see if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll have a chance to have questions at the end uh, cause I'm gonna be turning it over to Elisa who's gonna talk about our work with focus strategies. Just a quick question, Chair. How many people are currently housed in our additional housing sites and how many more will be when we get those additional two hotels? I, I can answer the last one and then um, I, the CFO at least wants to answer the first one. Um, the two additional hotels add approximately 130 uh, beds, about 100 in Watsonville, which actually calibrates a little bit because the spread is deeper in Watsonville. That was intentional. Um, and then Elisa, do you have the number I can give the the, the I'm gonna estimate? give you round figures. I would say in our shelter in place programs, so um, not the isolation quarantine, with the extension of the program at the Benchlands, we have about 300 additional capacity. So that's not talking about existing shelter. That's the new capacity. And then with the um, IQV sites, I wanna say it's another 300, including all the new beds as well. But I can, I can double check that, but that's, that's well, top of mind for me. So about 600, yeah, I it's, mean, it's a uh, significant increase. Considering uh, how many uh, of our uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness are sheltered uh, in the last point in, in, in time count, I think it was less than 20%. That's correct. So uh, this, is a big, this is a big step up uh, for uh, sheltering options uh, than we had before. Yes, so it appreciate is. Appreciate all the work that went into it. Thank you. Well, thank you for that handoff, Randy. Um, I do want to just take one moment to express my gratitude and appreciation for the entire shelter and care doc team. As Randy mentioned, it is HSD staff, HSA staff, CAO, the EOC. We have active city representation, community partners, including Housing Matters, Salvation Army, um, CAB, Downtown Streets team, uh, Encompass Downtown Outreach Workers, and the nearly 200 extra help disaster service workers that we've employed in this system. Um, this is why we're able to do this work. And it's, I feel so um, grateful for everyone's partnership and collaboration on this. In terms of my part of the presentation, I just wanna orient the board to the three items I will be covering today. The first two are really uh, around our focus strategies update per the board's request in June. The first item there is our six month work plan for our homeless response system. And that is for your consideration and approval. And then the second focus strategies item is um, some further refinements to our process to effectively reboot our three-year action planning process. We wanna give you an update as our effort to streamline, streamline that even further. And then the third item I'll be covering is to briefly cover our recommendation for the board to adopt a resolution for the receipt of an emer 
emergency solutions grant COVID. So it's a special grant. Um, and that's typically a, a, a very administerial item, but there's some interesting aspects of it we wanna highlight today. I'm predominantly gonna focus on the work plan because that is where really the, the meat of, of moving forward is. Um, so at our mid-June meeting, uh, the board accepted our staff recommendation to develop a six month work plan for our homeless response system. So aside from that just being good practice, um, this really stemmed from our project advisory group for the project that recognized that the delay of our three-year action planning phase due to COVID was leaving us with a significant gap as a system. And they wanted us to find a way to formalize the level of integration and collaboration that we were experience, experiencing in the shelter and care DOC and develop that shared practice together. So really we're focusing on integration and maintaining our COVID response focus and, and really looking towards results. Um, so where did the content come from? We worked with focus strategies and it, it really is a combination of our COVID response activities and then those actions we've identified um, as part of focus strategies to improve our homeless response system. Focus strategies looked at our incident action plans to really understand what we were planning on the ground as well as our four interim recommendations and turn those recommendations and where our work groups had ended into actionable steps moving forward. As you can see in the slide, the format of the work, of the work plan is, is starting to parallel the format used in our operational plan for the county. And really we're doing that so we can hone in on specific next steps. And those are gonna be filled out by our assigned leads, measurable outputs and impacts, and then focus strategies is gonna to continue to provide us some ongoing technical assistance for many of the strategies and objectives, along with tracking and evaluation of our process and our results. Like all work plans, we expect this to evolve as we get into the thick of it. I'm gonna to move to the next slide. So really let's take a minute to um, talk a bit about content at a fairly high level. So this slide shows the six, and I wanna stress, prioritized goals. This was an important piece of the feedback in developing this work plan. We wanted to make sure we were really at the top focusing at our, on our activities that are directly impacting the experience of people who are homeless. Within that, you'll see we, in these six goals, there are strategies and then linked activities. These activities range from very specific items like establish the shelter in place program at the Benchlands or acquire a hotel using pro project home key funds. Then they also move um, to sort of broader system improvement activities like um, evaluate our local rapid rehousing programs and look to expand the funding of that because those are the things that really get people from homelessness into housing. We anticipate that the work plan's articulation of high level goals will be in close alignment with those that are proposed in the three year action plan that you will be seeing later in the summer. Next slide, please. Next, I'm gonna to move to a quick update on our three year action plan development. Just for the viewing public, this has been a goal as the final output of our focus strategies assessment. And then where do we go from here? And really that three-year action plan is to provide the framework for our community efforts across all jurisdictions for the next three years in addressing homelessness to align those efforts and really provide that overarching goals, strategies, and priorities um, to drive us forward. We are now gonna build on our lessons from COVID-19 and sustain that work. It's also our time to start pivoting from our immediate response to longer term solutions and strategies to end homelessness. So uh, quickly, we did have another check in with our project advisory board as we in June had envisioned doing a webinar and a series of early input sessions from the public to drive the um, drafting of the plan. And when we checked back in with the project advisory committee, 
given the surge in cases and just how everyone's focus is on that response, they suggested we continue to streamline that process. So we're not gonna be doing an webinars and digital input um, uh, feedback sessions early. Instead, they've recommended that we go ahead, work on that draft plan. So there's a, a document for people to respond to. So we will be working with the project advisory board and key stakeholders in August to develop that draft plan, um, present that as a draft to the board in mid-September and then engage in some real focused engage, um, I will say online virtual feedback sessions and an open comment period through the end of September. We'll then take the first few weeks of October to finalize that plan and bring it to the board October 20th. Next slide. So this last item, as I mentioned, is really, um, a request, it's a simple action request for the board to adopt a resolution to accept receipt of our ESG CV grant and authorize staff to, exec, to um, execute agreements. This is something we typically handle as a consent item, but this is unique in a couple ways and we just wanted to highlight that. The funding for this, this particular program is just under a million dollars. And it is funding that is really, it comes from CARES Act funding that flowed from HUD, the um, Housing and Urban Development Department at the federal level to the state, to then our local continuums of care, here known as the Homeless Action Partnership. Um, and more funding from that source is expected to come to our community. This program itself is our first foray into building a specific case management housing navigation and flex funding program for our shelters. And it ad advances the focus strategy recommendation on addressing ho ho the housing focused shelters and moving people from shelter into permanent housing. The focus of this pilot will be on three of our COVID related programs. As we all know, we eventually will have to end those and we want to bring real housing solutions to our to our clients are in those programs now. We don't wanna be exiting people to other shelters or back on the street. So we see this as a very critical time for us to really step into this idea of case management and housing navigation. So with that, I'm open to any questions on the topics I've covered, but I'll also pass it to Randy. And, and my topic is to close out, summarize what the recommendations are to your board, but I'll pause to see if there's any comments or questions before I do. Chair, I just have some questions. Uh, any board members <laughs> first, and then uh, we'll open it up to the public. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanna say that uh, I've had the experience of working with Ms. Benson and the staff on the establishment of the temporary housing program in Soquel. I know uh, how hard people work to make sure that we have good programs and I've seen it up close in terms of it working well and I have great appreciation. Um, I'm really glad to see us moving forward with a more detailed plan. Um, and th there's some small things here in terms of language and then there's big things in terms of language. Um, for instance, there, there's an item that talks about a rent moratorium. And although there are many people who want us to have a rent moratorium, we really have an eviction moratorium. Uh, the bigger issue is it's hard, um, it's hard to figure out exactly what we might see in six months. The information is in there, but uh, I think we would be serving the public's interests uh, well by creating uh, documents that were easy to read. Uh, because there's a, there's a lot of infrastructure building, a lot of uh, uh, strategies and objectives and strategies and, and how it fits into the three-year plan and all these different pieces, but it's very hard to uh, ascertain exactly where we're going, how we're getting there. Um, and I think we need to work on clarity. So I, I just wanna encourage this because we know that there's a lot of public interest in, in these issues. Um, we are doing some good work uh, to house 600 people uh, in a relatively short period of time, to think about the case management program, to, to think about how we can ensure that the, the limited amount of housing is available is, is being uh, directed toward the people most vulnerable. Uh, th these are all really critical pieces 
but it's hard to wade through that with the, the, with the way that the documents are set up. So I just wanna encourage that and hope that we could see something in the near future um, that would be helpful for people to understand what the county's doing. Thank you. So super, uh, Chair Caput, I, I do have a closing slide that summarizes the recommendations before opening it up to the public comment. And if, if now's the time, unless there's other questions, I'll just close this out. Okay. Um, okay, so this may or may not relate to Supervisor Leopold's comment. Um, we are asking that the, the board memo that was submitted be accepted and filed, and specifically that we be directed to return by November 17th, and that could be the point in time or before where we come back with a more public-facing document. And recognition, there is a lot of talk in there about infrastructure stuff for us that's important, but to have something more public-facing makes sense. So we, we could uh, do that at November 17th or prior, whatever your pleasure. Um, the second is asking your board to consider and approve um, what uh, Elisa uh, listed in her quick summary, which is in the attachment with the recognition of Supervisor Leopold's request to come back with something sort of more simplified and viewable to the public, but as is to accept um, what's been submitted. Um, and the last is the formal ask to adopt the emergency solutions grant, the coronavirus grant resolution for up to, you know, just shy of the 2 million as listed. And that does allow us to put programming in place that has actually been referenced earlier to get some case management services going. So those are the three formal recommendations we are asking of your board. Um, and then we turn it to you for questions, comments, or public comment. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Supervisor McPherson, uh, I had a couple of questions, uh, if we could, before we go to the public. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Human Services Department, Health Services, uh, the Economic Opportunity, and the State House Office. This is uh, much more than we could have anticipated, uh, and more complicated. Uh, but uh, I, I think that um, it's especially important how we address the more efficient and effective governance system that we have. I uh, just basically, I'm, I'm really pleased about the expansion of the mental health services and case management uh, and housing navigation that's included in this. And I, I'm, I'm anxious to see how that's going to be, um, um, how, how we can make that grow and and uh, be, be more stable and address more people. Uh, a couple of questions that I had, um, maybe I can ask all three and then if you might have an answer to it uh, together. Uh, the 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 report mentions a request for a proposal a process for the shelter management. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges in that. Uh, is there, should we be proactively looking outside of our county? Or are we gonna be able to find, do you sense we can find a provider inside Santa Cruz County? Well, that's one. Um, the report identifies the ongoing encampment in the bench lands and our efforts to improve the, its structure. Uh, but I think the plan, you were going to come back October 20th. Um, uh, what's our plan after October? And maybe you will address it then, but, uh, and when is it slated uh, to close on the bench lands? Uh, so that's number two. Um, and then number three, uh, there's a lot of concern about fire danger in the Poganip uh, area posed uh, by these encampments. Uh, it, while it's it's in the city's jurisdiction to enforce laws against uh, setting fires and other harmful activity, um, what is the status of our efforts to offer options to those folks uh, who are living up there but need shelter to in place as a result of COVID-19? Is there anything immediate or will that be all, I'm sure it's going to be all part of the overall plan, but uh, is there anything immediate because that's a huge concern. We've uh, experienced some fires already in San uh, California, especially right now down in Southern California. Um, so those are the three questions I have. And uh, I don't know if you might be able to give me some general answers. I'm sure more specific answers will be coming in October. Uh, um, Supervisor McPherson, we both wrote the same notes and, and just whispered to each other, uh, Randy Morris, Human Services, I'll start to answer number one, and then I'll turn it over to Elisa to kind of fill in some more. Um, yes, there was a reference to a potential RFP to help get a vendor in place to help us with some of our shelter services. I just wanna start by acknowledging kind of the complexity of that. The FEMA funding is on 30 day cycles. I think a nonprofit vendor, it would be a tough ask to kind of take on something much like we're taking on right now to take on providing services. The funding stream is so unclear. That said, community-based organizations are really struggling right now. 
and we're all being very nimble. And we do have uh, infrastructure strain. There's only so many county employees and we have um, regular work to do that's not getting done that we need to get done. So I would just say it's referenced in there to offer a full disclosure to the board what we're thinking about. We have made no final decisions. Of course, an RFP and a contract will have to come back to your board, but we're trying to thread a needle of the staffing challenges we have, the FEMA money that's here now, and just how to best balance how we um, sort of spread the work that's very real, very complex and getting deeper. Um, so that's the answer to that question, no final answers, and we would welcome any direction from your board or thoughts on it and, and you know, whenever. Um, I'll turn it over to Elisa, who's been working more closely with the bench lands um, and then the other encampment area in Santa Cruz City uh, limits, complex issues. Sure. Um Supervisor McPherson, so in terms of the ongoing, um, the question around bench lands and our shelter in place program that we just started there, um, the expectation is we would be running that through October. And, but as we approach, you know, winter weather that it, it can't be at that site. It's just, it is a, a literally in the floodplain and, and not a reasonable place to be sheltering folks. So quite frankly, our shelter and care doc started yesterday talking about just as we've opened it, we have to put a team together to work with the city of Santa Cruz, assuming we have continued ability to fund something as to where we will move it when weather no longer allows it to be at that site. So we absolutely understand that it. we just as quickly as kicking it off, we have to think about where we will move um, from that site, assuming we are able to continue it um, depending on funding. So we will initiate that promptly and have a little strike team that starts thinking about that and working with the city on options. In terms of the fire danger in the Poganip and, and encampments um, in that area, as you reference Supervisor McPherson, really the decision around the balance of leaving folks in place versus addressing significant fire danger is up to the city. That said, if they ask for our help, we're, we will be happy to provide it. I do need to be realistic though about the capacity of our existing shelter and our expanded shelter system to um, absorb a lot more people. I would say today, if I checked our capacity numbers, we may have between North and South County shelters, I wanna say 20 to 35 beds. That's what we have available right now. And we have long lists and those are in the, in the, in the shelter in place programs, not in, that's not including our isolation quarantine as obviously that is reserved for folks who are, um, have been COVID exposed and need isolation and quarantine facilities. But the reality of the matter is we, depending on the numbers of folks who might be asked to leave the Poganip, we have a limited number of beds that we could make available to them. Very good, thank you. Understandable too. Shall we go for public comment? Okay. <clears throat> we'll now open it up. Uh, cup of, okay, you have three minutes. Thank you. Hey, do I have three minutes or two minutes? It just started clicking at two. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my name is Serge Cagno. Um, I know some of you guys. Uh, I want to really appreciate everybody who's um, you included, um, done, gone into the shelter and care uh, services for the homeless. Um, there are a lot of new programs that we've been able to do with the funding, and we've been able to do a lot of low barrier programs that you can see from the shelters that Elisa was talking about. That there are there are participants who have never been chosen to be in any program that we've had in our county. They have not been in HMIS, and they have not. Um, gotten services anywhere, but we've changed our service model to be more accommodating to people, to get more people into the services, which move them more to housing. Really want to appreciate the work on the case management as well, and trying to add that in and applying for some more funding for that. But also understanding that there have to be more housing options for people. We also have to be looking at other kinds of programs, whether that's uh, mid, mid pen where they did the uh, the program up 
towards Dominican that we need more big projects to actually house some people. Uh, I also want to appreciate the managed encampment at the Benchlands that's just started up. Um, and we realize you guys have been talking about it, that it's just a three month thing right now. It's just till end of October, trying to find another site for that, trying to keep for COVID, not having people spread out across the county and across the city, having effect on a lot of people. But right now, the people who have chosen not to be in the Benchlands are getting scattered today and tomorrow. So there's still, as we, the, uh, CDC has recommended not clearing encampments, that still happens in the city. So I would ask, and I would uh, ask the Board of Supervisors to, as we try to do our HSD DOC supporting the homeless, also trying to uh, support our cities uh, to uh, work with us as opposed to challenging the homeless because the homeless that choose to be in our programs are treated in certain ways in our jurisdictions. And that is part of our issue of how we get them uh, engaged in our programs. So thanks for everything you guys are doing. Hi, this is Jay Rosella Myers again. And um, 20 years ago, I served on the Santa Cruz Civil Grand Jury for an entire year. And this was a major problem that we looked into of homelessness. And I realized that it makes it even a special issue right now of trying to create a safe environment uh, under these challenging circumstances today uh, with COVID and uh, uh, trying to create a safe place that uh, creates more immunity. Um, and I have always wondered, especially right now, as businesses are going out uh, in Santa Cruz County, there are some pretty large businesses that have left the county, like Sears, like Toys R Us. And these are huge vacant spaces that are laying empty you know, and I wonder if that's anything that it's ever been looked into in terms of providing a safe shelter or environment. And can some of this money that's allocated for this set of circumstances be actually utilized uh, to work out deals with those commercial properties, you know, for some benefit of those people who are not able to lease those spaces? It seems like that might be a help full solution and if something like that could be focused on and pulled together. Anyway, um, I don't know if that's ever been considered, but I've thought about it a lot ever since I was on the grand jury and that was an issue way back when, even more important today. Anyway, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, Marilyn Garrett. I always think of this bumper sticker, it'll be a great day when the schools and everything else, social services I would have, have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a big sale to buy a bomber. Food Not Bombs is an appropriate title for a group that has over, I think a thousand uh, groups across the globe. Keith McHenry was a founder of it. He lives here in Santa Cruz. I heard him interviewed on a KPFA Flashpoints program. I think it would be helpful to meet some of the real stakeholders in this, the homeless and the people who are actually feeding the homeless to have him on the agenda to do a presentation here. He described when I heard him interviewed about the bench lands as uh, like an internment camp, the way it's fenced in uh, and you know, people, and, and I also have this flyer I'll give you again that relates to this. And Supervisor Leopold, you mentioned this is probably only serving approximately 20% of homeless, so woefully inadequate. However hard you try, you don't have 
a different structure of a system to actually provide for people, it's gonna not really help. So this says feeling sad and depressed. Are you anxious, worried about the future, feeling isolated and alone? You might be suffering from capitalism. Symptoms may include, and as I reread these, I thought this is really accentuated during these last few months. Symptoms may include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of hopelessness, fear, apathy, boredom, cultural decay, loss of identity, loss of free speech, incarceration, suicidal or revolutionary thoughts, death. We have a system problem here called capitalism and it's only gotten worse. And I'd like to see you advocate for having the budget change so that the military budget is very low and we get the money from the military budget for real needs in our community. Thank you. Thanks, Marilyn. Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. There's very few things that I'm actually sure of in life, but I know that before this uh, coronavirus even was spoken about, I spoke in the city of Santa Cruz Council several times that we are all homeless. And that has to do with the weapons technologies that most people greatly ignore. Um, our home is our castle, it's safety, it's security, it's privacy. Um, that's largely not being discussed and it's not being looked into. So I do think it's great that we're coming up, to, up with all these emergency procedures to deal with the homeless. But these procedures and ways to deal with the homeless and all of us who are homeless have been decided much long ago, much longer. FEMA has plans for us. And it's my understanding, and I could be wrong, that uh, on March 23rd, the President of the United States, President Trump, stepped down and put FEMA in charge. But yet our media isn't discussing that we no longer have a president. So I'm just concerned and I'm speaking and I'm glad that we can all still talk to each other. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi. I'd like to say one thing um, I meant to say earlier, uh, the library, the public library is closed and to help homelessness, why, why is that closed when so many other things are open? There's so many other things are open, but the public library is closed. I understand the concerns about the coronavirus, but other places are open. Why can the public library be accessible? Even if it was fewer people coming in, I really feel like you should reopen that. It would give people of low income or homeless people access to looking for jobs, um, a safe place to be off the streets, um, a safe place to think. So it's really invaluable for people who have low income and who are homeless. We can look for jobs, we can be safe, and we can think there but it's closed when so many other things are open. So please consider opening the library, um, the public library. Yeah. And um, I also think language matters. And to me, that sounded incredibly bureaucratic, what, what was talked about. Uh, if the motivation is just to get homeless people off the streets and out of the way and clean it up, we're people, we're human beings. So I don't, don't think that is realistic. People will react to it. Trust is an issue. I have a trust issue. I was falsely diagnosed with five different mental disorders. I think the doctor actually upped the disorder every time I told him I didn't have one no. at telecare. I think every single time I tried to convince him I didn't have a mental disorder, he added another one to the chart. So that's a problem. That's a white collar crime. That's medical my, my, my misdiagnosis. I knew I didn't have one, but I was diagnosed with one. So trust is an issue. What's the motivation of people getting, help, getting homeless people off the street? Is it to help them or is it just to clean them up? Because then it's not even realistic. We are human beings. Um, 
th this sound of having some empty place like uh, Target or any of those buildings used for encampment sounds really great. I mean, there's a lot of people who out there are homeless. So the sheer numbers that is, it has to be realistic. It can't be a small space. Um, but yeah, I think language matters. If you're, the motivation is simply to clean people up and to get people out of the way and shove people aside, it's just not realistic. But if it is to help people, that's good. But we can tell what the motivation of somebody coming up to you is. Are you, is this person simply trying to force their will on you or are they actually trying to help you? So motivation and language does matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have anybody downstairs? Any uh, other comments? I don't believe there's anybody downstairs, but we do have one web comment. This is from Becky Steinbrenner. Dear Board of Supervisors, I understand that the county plans to purchase multiple hotels to provide permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness. I assume the county is hoping to be awarded the funds to do this from Governor Newsom's Project Home Key, whose funds must be spent within six months. While I approve of providing effective shelter for homeless, I worry that when Project Home Key and other COVID-19 emergency revenues disappear, the county taxpayers will be left with the financial burden of maintaining the hotels and expensive programs. While state and federal reports projecting a 45% rise and homeless population due to the economic problems of the COVID-19 shutdowns. We cannot take an unsuitable level of debt burden for the county without some plan of how we can pay for it. I also feel the county has continued to ignore using county owned property at Crestview and Freedom Boulevard in Watsonville as permanent location for trailers donated by the state and federal government for COVID-19 shelter that could be kept on as a permanent housing site with more than 12 tra trailers the county received. The site had nearly 100 trailers installed for shelter after the 89 earthquake and should now and should be used now rather than the county fairgrounds and the Seventh Day Adventist camp because it's on the transportation corridor and is adjacent to medical and behavior, behavioral health services. Please reconsider this plan. Will the six month strategy development be a public process? It needs to be. Thank you sincerely, <clears throat> Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you. And uh, that concludes uh, public comment on item Mr. number. Chair. Oh, sorry. I have, I have a couple of uh, comments before we before we take a motion. Correct. Uh, and I'll bring it back to the board for comments. Uh, thank you. This is Ryan Coonerty. Um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Benson and Mr. Morris for their work. Um, they uh, both in working with the board and the community and the cities, but uh, also um, in maintaining a safe environment for people experiencing homelessness during uh, this pandemic. The numbers uh, speak for themselves. We could have had much higher numbers spread throughout the homeless community as well as the broader community. Um, but their their and their staff's efforts to uh, quickly intercede have made a big difference and I appreciate their their efforts going forward to manage it. And we are, as was mentioned, I think in Ms. Benson's uh, statement, you know, we're both trying to respond to a crisis and also build a, a lasting, uh, more effective system going into the future. And to do both those things at the same time while managing uh, all the various responsibilities is very difficult. I just wanna put in, I'm supportive of uh, the direction we're heading and the uh, the elements that we're moving forward today, I do want to state that um, you know uh, when we look at the case management, uh, hopefully with a very strong housing navigation uh, and diversion component built in, uh, as Supervisor McPherson mentioned, I think it's going to be really important to build the expectations of outcomes and to getting people into housing. Uh, much sooner than one year, um, and uh, to to figure out strategies to get people into housing sooner and faster um, will be essential so that it's actually in the contract and we're building um, both a culture and a policy approach going forward that is uh, that serves the people who are who are in need. So um, 
So as we pursue this CARES Act money um, uh, for needed case management, I hope that we we're using that as an opportunity to build management and expectations in going forward. Uh, thank you. Any other comments from uh, board members? I'll move the recommended actions. Coonerty. Second. <laughs> uh, uh, Chair, I would just uh, add that I hope we can get these uh, more um, easy to understand documents way before November 17th. Uh, I think that's the very important, but I, I appreciate what's going on. I want to thank you also. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a tremendous uh, uh, help to the community and uh, we all appreciate everything. Uh, will the clerk please conduct the roll call? Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chairman Caput? Aye. The motion passes unanimously and if we can take maybe a, what, a 12 minute break uh, and we'll come back right around 22 minutes to 12. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go to uh, <clears throat> item number nine. Consider a resolution issuing emergency regulation number 2020-01 to temporarily suspend. Is your microphone on? I don't think your microphone is on. Oh, it is on. I got it on. Okay. I, I'm probably not. Okay. It's so much harder with the mask. Maybe so. Project. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, resolution 2020-01, uh, temporarily suspend single use bag cha charges in the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. We'll have a report on that. And uh, hopefully the other, the cities uh, in, the, uh, in the county are gonna hopefully follow this also, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Caput and the rest of the board. My name is Casey Colossum with Public Works, the Recycling and Solid Waste Services Manager. The proposed resolution is to temporarily suspend the county mandate for businesses to charge customers for bags during the emergency. The purpose of this resolution is to protect the health and safety of consumers and retail workers during the COVID-19 pandemic while reducing disproportionate impacts of bag charges to low income shoppers. The change would affect all retail businesses in the unincorporated areas of the county, but not in the four local cities, unless they take similar action. As an emergency res resolution, this measure would be effective immediately upon approval by the board, and the suspension would be in effect until lifted by the board. Existing requirements for types of bags allowed would remain unchanged by this resolution. Businesses would still have the option to charge for bags if they choose, but would no longer be required to do so. Businesses in the community will be notified by mail, press releases, the county website, and social media. And this is in line with the Cal OSHA guidance for um, infection preventions in stores meant to protect the workers by not having them handle customers reusable bags. And it also helps the elderly and disabled who um, would not be required to bag their own groceries. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, do we have any questions from the board members? Just for clarity's sake, this would, uh, th people would, uh, grocers would be the ones who get to choose whether they charge it or not, not us. Correct, there's nothing to prevent a grocer from charging for a bag or any other store. And my question would be, uh, uh, what cities in the county are also gonna suspend uh, the bank? I'm not aware of what the other cities are doing, but I imagine they would do something similar. Okay. And uh, any other supervisor questions? 
Uh, we'll open it up to public hearing. Uh, each person, anybody want to speak on the item? We have a couple, thank you. We'll give you three minutes, okay. Again, and I, um, I just have to say, I've heard so many complaints by the retail operations about having to charge for bags. And it's been, God, it's been so unclear about whether or not it's safe to bring our own bags, bag the things ourselves. It's like all over the map in terms of, but I just heard a report that, um, Plastic bags were used for a while by many of the retail uh, um, grocery stores, especially in town, that uh, they said they were safer. But in the report, I actually heard that the plastic bags hold the germs and virus and bacteria and stuff three days longer than the paper bags. <laughs> and so uh, it's like, I wish there was some clarity about which thing was actually safer. Like at staff, for instance, we have the bags that they give us when we spend over a certain amount of money and they refuse to take those now in terms of recycling them. And, and so it's just very unclear about what's the right way to go at this point. And um, it would be nice to actually have some information about what way is actually the safest, you know? And um, so it's my understanding that you're gonna just leave it up to the retailers at this point, or is there gonna be a resolution about that they can do the no charge thing? Cause I know it's such a pain for them to charge for the stuff. So anyway, a couple questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I think this is a question of safety and economy. I believe the gentleman who first spoke on this item was for public works recycling or something. Um, the example that we can't bring in our own reusable bags and reuse them is kind of another question of how our freedoms are being removed. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate that one of my favorite restaurants in the county is still open but I know that when I go and eat there, rather than use a container and pile on as much salsa as I want, I've walked out of there and realized that I grabbed 26 little things of salsa um, and that stuff really largely doesn't get recycled. And so there's a lot of bigger issues going on in our society right now than these petty things of whether the county is gonna decide to force businesses to charge or not charge for bags. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good comment. Sure. Hi, Marilyn. So I was looking at a note I had here from listening to news a year ago, and it said $180 billion had been put into new plastic production. So this thing about single used plastic bag is a drop in a bucket. And we've seen, I mean, it's just like, we're inundated with plastic with all of this. And um, what was the figure, my friend, did you just cite that? I think she said she heard on the news, there's not now more masks in the ocean from all this than plastic bottles. So this is a huge problem. We know plastic doesn't decompose, it's totally toxic. And it just is astounding how we're told Oh, here's this terrible, terrible problem. And here's the solution. You know, plastic bags, toxic disinfectants smothered all over. And I heard some of the disinfectant products have actually been recalled because they had, was it methanol, something so toxic with alcohol that it could destroy your organs. So what is really healthy here and what isn't? And um, viruses are natural to nature. 
uh, you know, they circulate all over the globe. They penetrate this. There's something really the matter with this picture. But certain businesses are really doing well. You know, Apple, the computer business, the sanitizer business, the plastic business, the billionaires are getting wealthier. So I do think this should be repealed. And I'd like to see, I'd like to see plastic like prohibited and bring our own cloth bags when we go grocery shopping, like we've been asked to do so often. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, any other comments? Yes, we've got six web comments. The first web comment is from a Milan Lewis. I am opposed to this ordinance to suspend the prohibition on single use plastic bags in retail establishments. Plastic bags are a huge source of plastic pollution and death of marine animals in the waters bordering Santa Cruz County. Customers can easily accommodate restrictions on the use of reusable bags in stores to prevent coronavirus transmission. Trader Joe has set up tables outside the store entrance to allow customers to bring their groceries from the store in a cart and load their groceries into their own reusable bags. As senior citizens, my wife and I find this easy to use and no inconvenience. We much prefer to avoid adding to ocean pollution from plastic bags. The second comment is from Catherine O'Day. Good morning, supervisors. I am Catherine O'Day, executive director of Save Our Shores. As you know, Save Our Shores has advocated for smart policies related to ocean plastic pollution for more than a decade. And with your leadership, we have made considerable progress. Therefore, we would be remiss if we did not express concern about the proposed resolution issuing emergency regulation number 2020-01 to temporarily suspend single ba use bag charges. Before preparing my comments, I researched the California government code cited by the County Department of Public Works namely code 8634 to try to understand why the DPW feels justified in proposing the resolution. My conclusion is that DPW may have taken an overly broad interpretation of the code. Change Lab Solutions, a national organization based in Oakland, California, advises equitable law and policies to ensure healthy living for all, published a paper in May of this year assessing the authority of local governing bodies to order the regulation necessary to provide the protection of life during COVID-19 health emergency. Change Lab Solutions, multidisciplinary team of lawyers, planners, and policy analysis agrees that the California code does not indeed grant local governing bodies authority to enact and enforce laws to address health emergencies but with the caveat that those laws do not conflict with state law. Suspending the single use bag charge would clearly conflict with the statewide plastic ban. Hence, the logical conclusion is that passing the proposed resolution would cause the statewide ban on single use plastics to become the governing regulation in our county, thereby, thereby rendering the resolution moot. If passing this regulation would trigger the state law, you would not accomplish the stated objective of providing relief to those enduring economic hardships due to the coronavirus. Instead, all that would be accomplished is the loss of our county's reputation as an environmental leader. Most residents of our county readily embraced our local bag ban and were, and, and were proud that our community was among the first in the state to take action to address plastic bag litter and its impact on the health, even the very life of our Monterey Bay wildlife. We strongly urge you to oppose the resolution and maintain integrity of our own county's regulatory process and the authenticity of our environmental leadership. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there, oh, there's more. <laughs> this one is from Ke Ken Davenport. It is a very small but welcome gesture by administrative officer. Next one is by Gail Marie McNulty. While we must protect people and local businesses that are suffering as a result of the economic downturn, reversing our weakening hard won environmental protections like our county's plastic bag, like our county's plastic bag ban is not the right plan. Now that the state's temporary suspension of the bag ban has been allowed to expire, 
The state mandate of the minimum 10 cent bag charge stands as a baseline of environmental protection. The county would be wise to follow the city of Santa Cruz lead in upholding the 25 cent bag charge while amending the original ordinance to include a list of hardship exemptions that would ensure those who have need to receive bags free of charge may do so without allowing our county to needlessly slide backward in a way that negates our community's commitment to defend our bay and our children's shared future on this threatened planet. We know that those with underlying health issues are more vulnerable to the worst outcomes with COVID-19. However, we don't know yet the health effects or potential heightened vulnerability being created by the credit cards worth of plastic all humans are estimated to be eating, drinking and breathing each week. We've all seen images of how the plastic pandemic is devastating our marine life. Locally, the increase in takeout food combined with massive increase in traffic to our beaches has already led to a huge increase in the amount of bags and other trash barraging our beaches and other public places. Unfortunately, much of this garbage has, has and will make its way into our precious bay. Meanwhile, the plastic industry has been hard at work spreading falsehoods about the safety of plastic, which has been proven to be more of a vector for the virus than organic materials. They are using this opportunity to increase production, further harming many low income communities of color, the communities that generations of environmental racism has left vulnerable. Enabling disposal lifestyles harms the communities where the plastic is produced and the places where most of the garbage accumulates. In both these cases, the hardest hit people tend to be the poor, not white leaders living in relatively safety Leaders living in relatively safety must understand how their choices echo beyond the privileged communities in which they vote. This was from Becky Steinbrenner, dear board of supervisors. Thank you for removing the added cost to patrons who may not be allowed to bring their own reusable shopping bags into the stores. The rules are very confusing about this and seem to change nearly daily. However, what is clear is that even though society is an, is an economic crisis brought about by the COVID-19 shutdowns, people still want and need to care for the environment. I have watched in dismay as single use plastic bags have returned to the stores and also along the roadsides and parking lots where they are discarded or blow out of the garbage trucks. If the county feels it is necessary to allow single use bags to proliferate, proliferate again by banning the use of reusable shopping bags, please also ban the use of single plastic bags and only allow paper bags to be handed out in all stores for customers purchases. The amount of plastic that has increased going into the landfill has skyrocketed due to increased online shopping and takeout food containers. Please support the environment even during this crisis. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. And the last comment is from Jean Brucklebank. As elders age 75 and 71, we find no problem with bagging our own groceries. I believe, no, okay, I'm sorry. I thought I read this one already, but I haven't. We take reusable bags to Trader Joe's, our shopper's corner, or our Live Oak Super. We keep them on our shoulders, just like they were a purse. We choose our groceries telling the cashier that we do not need bags, paper or plastic. They are always very happy to hear this. They put the items back into the shopping bag. After scanning, they put the items back into the shopping cart after scanning them. We take our carts outside and fill our personal reusable bags. Trader Joe's even provides sanitized tables as a service. We simply use the sidewalk at Shoppers and the same with Live Oak Super. Everyone is masked. This saves paper, plastic, and the cost of providing bags for customers. This works easily and it is safe for the staff as well as the public. We are distressed at the huge additional amount of waste we see in the environment during this pandemic. So much more plastic, including masks, is floating around, spilling out of garbage bins. We do not support the emergency resolution. We would support the county clarification that says if it's is, <clears throat> we would support a county clarification that says it is advisable for those who drive to buy large quantities of groceries to have empty cardboard boxes or reusable bags in their cars for the purpose of easily bagging their own groceries from the shopping carts. The health of humans is interactively connected to the health of the environment. Let's not trash one while providing for the other. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson, I see your hand up. How are you yeah, doing? Uh, actually, <clears throat> you finished the public comment, uh, but I, we, we all are clearly aware of the adverse impacts that uh, plastic bags have on our environment. But however, I support suspending this fee until um, reusable bags are uniformly allowed by real retailers in the county. Uh, right now, that's not the case as some grocery stores are permitting them again and some are not. Uh, but I would, uh, there might be more discussion from the board, but I have a proposed motion uh, when it comes to that uh, with um, some ad additional directions. But uh, there may be other board members who would like to speak first. Uh, Chair. Okay, yes. Uh, I, I appreciate the work of our uh, public works uh, staff to think about uh, ways uh, to address problems that are uh, presenting through the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't support the, the current uh, proposal. Um, I think that the idea that uh, it's gonna be reducing cost is, is questionable in part because A, the retailer gets to choose B because the state uh, uh, plastic bag uh, requirements are still in place. We heard testimony from your staff this year uh, that said that when we looked at what were the incentives to get people to change their behavior, 10 cents wasn't enough, it was 25 cents. And so um, I, I believe that, that um, the risk of transmission of this virus is low off these kind of objects, um, that it's, it's reasonable to uh, to think that someone can bag their own groceries. And we know, and we've detailed, and we have supported the impact that plastic bags have in our environment. So I can't support this at this time. Uh, any other comments from board members? Uh, Mr. Chair, again, uh, Supervisor McPherson, in my discussions with our health officer, Dr. Gail Newell, uh, she does not believe that reusable bags pose a risk from a disease perspective either. Uh, but I know that single use uh, bags pose a risk to the environment and her premise and my premise is to stay away from single use bags. But I think we need some uniformity in the implementation of any policy. And that's why I would uh, make, uh, make a, a recommended uh, motion, but I don't know if there's any other board uh, member that would like to speak to this. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just make my own comment. Uh, uh, you know, years ago, I used to think plastic was, uh, you know, it was okay. It breaks down. It does, it does break down, but uh, it breaks down to a, I call it a plastic mush. It ends up in the water, these little microfibers and all that. And there's so much of it that uh, it's everywhere now and it's in the water and I was reading it's in our clothes after you wash your clothes. Uh, uh, so the, the only real solution is going to be the manufacturers if they can come up with something that I guess we call biodegradable that uh, will replace uh, plastic. But uh, uh, that's something we need to really look at. <laughs> Uh, and this, uh, what I call the, the mush from plastic that ends up in the water, does that ever break down even further? Uh, I mean, it's breaking down and gets smaller and smaller. Does it ever just break down? If it'll be, cons I mean, it gets such at a microscopic level that it gets consumed by the, the food chain. And during that process, it breaks down even farther to a point where it's, you know, it's molecular constituents, but it's whether that can be metabolized and broken down even farther is, I'm not an expert on that, but. Sure. Uh, yeah, and I, and I know, uh, uh, you know, we're in the pandemic and I, I realize uh, that we need to do something. The one alternative that we do, and I think a lot of people do, is uh, we don't take a bag at all. Uh, we put it back into the uh, shopping cart, go to the car and then take it out of the cart and put it into bags that we have in the car. Um, and uh, I have talked to some grocery uh, managers and they, uh, some people do bring in reusable bags that are very, very dirty. 
and uh, they don't like that. And they don't also don't like charging the 25 cents or whatever it is. So I'm, I'm in favor of the motion. It's a temporary motion, right? That's correct. It's temporary. Okay, go ahead, Bruce. Mr. Mr. Chair, I, yeah. So I'd like to move the recommended actions uh, with additional direction for county communication regarding the fee suspension to include a county preference for retailers to allow reusable bags uh, and request that clearly state their protocols for use by their customers. Uh, I think we need some uniformity in this and uh, would love to see the, the cities and everyone else co uh, get uh, come along with us in this as well. So that's my recommended action um, in motion with, with uh, additional direction. Uh, kind of an amendment, right? Yeah, just okay. have some direct communication about the fee sure. suspension. So we include a preference for retailers to allow reusable bags and sure. uh, clearly uh, state their protocols for the, the use by their customers. Okay, uh, I can second that, right? Yes, I can, I, I'll, I'll second that. And then uh, the one other question I have, uh, we need to get the information out to the public uh, about, uh, you know, uh, I know uh, we've cut down a lot on the, the small plastic bags, but the, the plastic bags that people are using to put uh, their garbage in, and when garbage comes around uh, once a week, uh, they take the big, uh, you know, black uh, hefty bags and put those in the garbage. Uh, we need to come up with an alternative, and uh, I guess there are what's called uh, green bags or something like that. Do we know where they sell all of those and how people can buy those instead of the plastic, uh, the big plastic bags that people put garbage in? Right, there are compostable plastic bags, but they we're reserving their use for like food waste, food scraps. So. Uh, they can be collected with the uh, used to collect food waste, you know, cleanly and um, would break down in a commercial compost facility. Um, those, I don't know if they're widely available to people at retail stores, um, but the, the other type of plastic bags, uh, you know, you don't have to use them in your trash cart. Um, they're a preference for keeping, you know, the residue from sticking to the carts or from your. Your, the containers you have in your house. Right, the, the garbage can go right into the, uh, uh, you know, big container, uh, the garbage container. That's correct. <laughs> right, but uh, it's a lot easier, especially for, you know, a lot of people to just take the bag out of your uh, home garbage can and then put it straight into the uh, garbage can that goes out to the you know, weekly. Uh, do, do we have any names on those, uh, the the ones that break down? Um, I, I would have to look that up and get back to you. Okay, uh, well, I, I would add that we look it up and we also uh, put that uh, on our website or uh, we get the information out to the public. Because uh, I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to go out and buy something uh, so I cut down more on the use of plastic. We can't burn it either because then that's bad for the atmosphere, right? Plastic's just good. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of uh, things we can do with it. <clears throat> okay, we have Chair, a motion Chair, and a second. Chair, I, I would just like to say, I appreciate efforts uh, by my colleague uh, to, to try to craft something that would work. I, I unfortunately will not be able to support the motion. I think we all agree that plastics are bad for the environment. We have taken that action consistently here. And I appreciate uh, the, the comment from my colleague that has uh, validated my conversations also with uh, health professionals about the risk of transmission. Um, we, at the early stage of this, of this pandemic, we were worried about issues like this. Now we know. And so uh, we need, I, I think policies like ours uh, help move retailers back into using science to make the decisions about what kind of bagging uh, rather than removing uh, cost, maybe, 
uh, uh, in order to get them to do the right thing. So I can't support this. I, I, I think I think it's a slide backwards, um, and um, I hope it is not picked up by the other cities. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, this is Supervisor Coonerty. Um, so uh, I'm reluctantly uh, supporting the motion. I, I agree. Plastics are a horrible thing, and I look forward to reinstating uh, this fee. I think the challenge is you have retail workers, and I know this um, from my family's own experience and also just from being out about, is you have retail workers trying to navigate a very complex environment with a lot of conflicting information. And it's as we can see from our next item, we already have um, people who are making uh, relatively low wages uh, being forced to confront people who have different, um, you know, who are, are unwilling to participate and are stressed and are, you know, are challenging different ordinances. And it's one more thing when people bring a bag and they don't want to, they want you to bag it or there's not a place to bag it outside. And then, but the retail worker doesn't want to take it. And it's a very uh, difficult situation right now. And so just to try to provide clarity for people in terms of uh, the rule, I would support if our health officer wants to send out a letter saying that it's absolutely safe um, for people to reuse bags. I think that would help a lot, but um, uh, but it's been a lot of, we haven't, we haven't had a formal statement from the CDC or other groups and retail workers are stressed. And so trying to give people a sense of uh, get to let the business owners in consultation with their workers trying to figure out a, a situation that works until where the state of emergency is lifted. Uh, I'll support it, but I understand. I, I I look forward to the day when this pandemic is behind us, and when we can get back um, to try to get uh, to to getting plastic out of our lives. Um. You wanted to say something? No. Uh, the chair, the how, how the public closed. comment has, has already it's stopped, public has ended. I know, but how, how short can you make your comment? Uh, I came here to talk about something else, but I heard about this. Just listen to what you're saying. You, you need Sir, to wear you the mask. Sir, you have to have your mask on. You have to wear the mask. You have to wear your mask. Okay. Technology is here in the bags here. They even have strings so you can tie. Okay. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. And I, by the way, uh, I, as I understand it, plastic sometimes takes 10,000 years to break down. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion by Supervisor McPherson, a second by myself. Uh, the clerk, uh, please call Super, the roll. Uh, hi. Supervisor Leopold? No. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. Uh, the motion passes four to one. And now we go to item number 10. Uh, remember, if you already spoke Chair, on um, item number 10 earlier. Chair uh, Caput? Yes. Chair Caput, uh, you may want to consider holding this over till after lunch. Uh, it's up to you, you know, it's up to you, but there's, um, we, have, we have close session as well. Right. So it's up to you what you would like to do, uh, do you think we can finish how, it? How long do you think it'll be? Uh, we did have most everybody spoke on this earlier. Uh, all right, let's, uh, we'll, we'll have to come back a little bit before 1.30 then, right? Or 1.30? No, it'd be after 1.30. After 1.30. You can try and get through it, but I'm- Okay, we'll do that. Uh, we'll, we're gonna now go to closed session. Uh, do we have anything to report on a closed session? No. No, nothing to report out of closed session. And I know. Uh, a lot of us came here to speak or to hear it in 10. So you can just close it for like 10 people who want to comment to try and take 15 minutes of your time. No, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people spoke this morning uh, on the same item. You can't, yeah, you can't speak twice on the item. I don't know. We're not speaking twice on the item. Anyway, we'll, we're going to break for lunch. We have closed session. Okay. I mean, uh, for uh, closed session. Thank you.
to visit by appointment within a property zone for timber production and special use. In the Eureka Canyon area, assessor's parcel number 106291-16 under a less than three acre timber conversion exemption and confirm the project is exempt from requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act as outlined in the memorandum of the planning direction. And we'll go ahead and start with a, a, a report and then we'll open it up. Okay, go ahead. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Cramblett, the project planner for the proposed project. The matter before the board is a de novo public hearing regarding application number 181556, a proposal to operate a business that will allow clients to spread cremated remains at selected trees and to visit by appointment within a property zone timber production and special use in the Eureka Canyon area. Excuse me, we don't um, have the audio going on the teams. We're out of practice. Okay. Okay. Should I repeat? No. Okay. Good. Before I begin, I would like to make a correction to attachment A in your packet for the notice of exemption. Under section E for categorical exemption, I would like to add a class four exemption for minor alterations to land, for grading that is associated with the improvements, and for the ashes that are mixed with local soil prior to being spread around selected trees. Additionally, as mentioned to your board this morning, additional materials were submitted as late correspondence for this project. The material is an updated map of polygons and replaces the draft map of polygons. Okay, hey, this is an overview of the site that illustrates the general location of the proposed parcel of the parcel uh, within the county. The subject parcel is approximately 84 acres in size with approximately 76 acres zoned timber production and eight acres zoned special use, which is located in the southeast corner of the parcel. The applicant has revised the project proposal since the time it was acted upon by the zoning administrator and the planning commission. Prior to the jurisdictional hearing, in a letter to the board dated June 9th, 2020, Better Place Forest indicated it would be willing to modify the project proposal to reduce the area used for the memorial forest on the TP portion of the parcel. The modified proposal now limits the use to an approximately three acre area and includes a request for a less than three acre conversion exemption. And what this does is essentially converts timberland to a non-timber use. And in this case, the timber or trees will remain on the site. This is an overall site plan that shows the location of the proposed improvements and conversion areas that will be located in the Southwest portion of the site. And this slide shows uh, more closely the conversion area where the proposed improvements will take place. And it'll be approximately 8,625 square feet, all which occur in the Southwest portion of the parcel. The improvements include driveway access improvements, a parking area for 15 spaces, including one accessible space and a new 495 square foot non-habitable building that will have a restroom and storage. And that is in the red is the non-habitable structure. In addition, the conversion area will include selected areas where the spreading of cremated remains will occur in, within defined areas or polygons. This slide shows the updated map of polygons and shows the actual location of the polygons that are grouped in the Southwest portion of the parcel. Conversion areas that contain disconnected polygons such as this one are typical for uses for organized camps. 
and counting the area within the polygons is an accepted practice. Additional areas where clients may select trees and spread cremated remains would be in the southeast portion of the parcel, so in special use, which is approximately eight acres. The site would be open two to five days per week, depending on the season, by appointment only during daylight hours with supervised visits. The applicant proposes to maintain the native forest through periodic timber harvesting to enhance timber stands towards an old growth type ecosystem. This use has never been previously considered by the county. As part of a con consultation, staff determined that the use is sufficiently similar to the land use category, organized camps and facilities for outdoor recreational, educational, religious activities. However, the Planning Commission disagreed with that determination. Staff's rationale was based on the following consideration, in addition to the purposes of organized camps and conference centers as listed in Santa Cruz County Code Section 1310-692. Chapter seven of the general plan for parks, recreation, and public facilities, objective 7.9 for organized camps and conference centers states an objective to quote, allow for a full range of educational, religious, and recreational facilities operated by organized groups to utilize varied scenic and natural settings of the county's rural and mountain areas while providing proper management and protection of local natural resources, unquote. Staff believe the proposed use was consistent with these purposes and objectives because it involves a supervised program that provides spiritual, social, and recreational elements to visitors in a controlled setting with minimal impacts to neighboring properties while preserving scenic amenities. In addition to the question about whether the use could be considered an organized camp, opponents and planning commissioners questioned the proposed use's compatibility with the timber production district. In response to this opposition, Better Place Forest modified their proposal, which reduced the area for the Memorial Forest to the less than three acre conversion exemption on the TP portion of the site. This project could potentially be consistent with the purposes of the timber production district as outlined in Santa Cruz County Code Section 1310-371A because the applicant has indicated in their updated project statement the intention to utilize active forest management methods that include periodic timber harvesting to restore and enhance timber stands towards an oak growth type ecosystem. This will be accomplished by filing a timber harvest plan during the next eligible window and actively maintaining the existing timber infrastructure such as skid roads and landings by utilizing them in their network of trails. When non-timber uses are proposed in the TP district, there are special findings that are required to demonstrate that the proposed use will be compatible with timber production. These special findings have been revised to reflect the modified proposal, which would be adopted if the board determines to approve the proposed application. Considering the modified proposal, which reduces the area of Memorial Forest on the 76 acre timber production portion of the site to less than three acres, approximately 73 acres of the TP portion of the parcel would be available for inclusion in a timber harvest plan. According to the Project Forester, the size and location of the proposed converted areas depicted on the updated map of polygons would not impact the viability of future timber harvest operations on the property. In addition to these issues, there have been questions about whether the proposed use should be classified as a cemetery. Included in your packet as attachment I were definitions and examples of cemeteries in State Health and Safety Code Law, Section 7003. Cemeteries as defined by Section 7003 are not allowed in the TP or SU districts, only in the public facilities district within the county. There is another section of law, Section 7116, that addresses when scattering of remains is not considered to be associated with a cemetery. The letter from the applicant's legal consultant Tanya Marsh with McNeely Law dated August 2nd, 2020 makes the case that the proposed use is not a cemetery. 
The interpretation to be made by your board relates to whether the proposed scattering of cremated remains of more than one person as proposed by the applicant results in areas not distinguishable to the public as these factors relate to whether the use could be considered a cemetery. In response to comments from members of the community and the board, staff has added and amended the recommended conditions of approval submitted as attachment D in your packet. The applicant has indicated it supports the added and amended conditions. Questions remain as to the nature and compatibility of the use, whether it is a cemetery or not, and whether the proposed location and level of operation is appropriate, even if allowed on TP and SU properties. Staff has prepared alternate sets of findings, one for denial and another for approval of the project. Furthermore, in consideration of public input and of board discussion, it may be appropriate to impose additional conditions that further limit the extent of activities on the site, should the board decide to approve the use. If the board determines that the proposed use is a cemetery that is not permitted within the timber production district, or if the board otherwise determines that findings for approval cannot be made, take action to adopt the attached findings for denial of the application found in attachment B. If the board determines to approve the application, either as currently proposed by the applicant or as may be modified by the board, determine the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and direct staff to file a notice of exemption found in attachment A with the, added, with the addition of a class four exemption. If the board determines that the use qualifies as a less than three acre timber conversion exemption and the use is appropriate for the proposed location, then take action to approve application 181556 with the attached findings for approval found in attachment C and subject to conditions of approval found in attachment D and pursuant to additional materials in the revised memo to the board and the updated map of polygons dated July 28, 2020 and potentially with additional conditions of approval regarding acreage, number of polygons or trees or other metrics to further limit the extent of operations. This concludes staff's presentation. Chair, I have a question or two. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, the, I know there's a lot of uh, the space given in the board letter about cemeteries, but it seems as though the, the State Bureau has already weighed in on that. Um, and we can make a uh, different finding, but, but we already, uh, we've already gotten something from the state, correct? Yes, correct. The other question I had is, if someone were to purchase this property and want to build a house on it, what would be the process for them being able to build a house on this property if if they wanted to if they wanted to build it in the tp portion uh the code does allow people to build a house on the property they do not they're not required to harvest the timber but they yeah. can build a house on it with a permit so they could come in with something that was less than three acres yes okay thank you uh, are you finished with your report Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how many, uh, there are already memorials out there. Uh, how many memorials are out there that were uh, actually placed and were cremated remains were scattered or buried uh, up to this point? You On the subject site? Uh-huh. They have not been operating on the site. So there are none that we know unless. But my, my understanding is. They have that. another operation in point in the Mendocino area. They do have one other site. Um, I think it's point, the, point the exact mean. location is escaping me, but Better Place Forest has one site where they are actually in operation, but it's in Mendocino. It's north of us. Okay, they they are not doing, they have not spread any 
cremated remains at this site that we're talking about. Is that the question? But some sites, uh, that one site does have some scattered remains also. Uh, Outside already. of the county, yes, but n not within the county. Right. Do we know how many? They have one other site and they can, the applicant can actually discuss that in further no, detail. I, I probably guess what I'm getting at is, uh, are there any trees that have plaques on them now? It says uh, some- Not on the area. subject site, no, no. Not on the site that we're talking about off by sort of Lagoon Road, no. The, the subject parcel does not have any um, remains or plaques or anything on it, no. Not from the applicant. Uh, any other questions from board members? Okay, uh, I will now open up the public hearing. First, we'll hear from the applicant who will have a total of 10 minutes to present evidence as to the merits of the application. Next, after that, we'll hear from the parties opposing the application which will have 10 minutes to present evidence to why the board should not approve the application. And at the end of the comments, so we'll have uh, the applicant uh, can respond and have five minutes and then the other uh, public will have, uh, be able to speak also. Okay. Uh, so if we can hear now from the applicant, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Possible to request slightly more time so our forester can add some detailed comments on the feasibility of forestry on the site, possibly 12 or 15 minutes. Uh, what I, we're talking about. Is it possible to add two to two to five minutes to the time to speak? Uh, you mean you have five minutes and somebody else five minutes? If I could have seven and he could have seven. Total of 10, it's fine. Sorry? Okay, so uh, you wanna go on a t five minute timer now? Would it be possible to have seven and seven just to extend it a bit or? Okay. Okay, you. when you're done, we'll stop the timer and let the next person walk up. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Caput and members of the board. My name is Sandy Gibson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Better Place Forests. I know this is a very challenging time for Santa Cruz County and for all of you as leaders of this community. Um, and I especially appreciate your time and attention today in hearing this issue. I would like to offer brief remarks about Better Place Forests and this project. And then I will invite Justin Kaufman, uh, a certified forester at North Coast Resource Management to share his prof professional expertise on the project. Our goal is to open a memorial forest that provides a beautiful final resting place for the ashes of loved ones in this community, allows sustainable harvesting of timber, and creates jobs and economic opportunity for Santa Cruz residents. Uh, we're grateful for the two years of planning time and effort the county staff have put in, and we are very pleased to report that the robust planning process has generated a revised project that squarely fits within allowed zoning, zoning uses and the allowed less than three acre conversion. I would like to address a few important issues today. First, our project's compatibility with the requirements of the Timber Production Zone District and the Special Use Zone District. Second, to confirm that Better Place Forest does not operate cemeteries in California. And third, what we at Better Place Forest aim to provide to the Santa Cruz community. For compatibility, we have worked closely with the county's planning staff to ensure our project fits within the definition of organized camps and facilities for outdoor recreational, educational, and religious activities a use that is allowed in the TP and SU districts. As staff has noted, organized camps are defined by SC County Code section 1310.700-C as a site having facilities for the purpose of conducting a supervised program which provides educational, spiritual, social, or recreational elements. And the purpose of the organized camp and conference center is among other things to foster commercial use of the scenic and recreational values of the county in the timber zone and SU zone. Our memorial forest fits squarely within this use. We host a supervised program, our staff supervise guest visits, and elements of those visits are spiritual, social, and recreational. Santa Cruz County has approved many other projects in the timber zone, including the Mount Madonna Center, the Pima Oso Ling Retreat Center, Camp Campbell, and the Insight Retreat Center. When concerns were raised around our project, the ultimate question was if spreading ashes, if spreading ashes in the timber zone could potentially create a conflict with future timber production. California law, state law is clear that ashes do not receive any special protections after they've been returned to a family. So their presence in the timber zone would not create a legal conflict. However, 
We understand the concern and the importance of sustainable timber in Santa Cruz and have updated our project application to perform spreadings only in the less than three acre conversion area. So no ashes would be spread in an active timber zone if this finding were found. With our updated project plan, 100% of the TP zone on the property would be available for timber harvest. All timber infrastructure would be maintained and it is our understanding that Cal Fire would require any unharvestable trees, so any tree on the property that could not be harvested would have to be included in the conversion area. So to the extent that any stakeholders are concerned that areas in between polygons would not be harvestable, the Cal Fire conversion process will confirm the viability of proposed harvest areas. And only those areas where harvest is possible would be, uh, where harvest is not possible would be included. As a result, by limiting spreading activities and memorial trees to the less than three acre conversion area in the SU portion of the property, we are accepting the plan that was initially proposed by the Farm Bureau of Santa Cruz County, Redwood Empire, Big Creek Lumber, and the California Forestry Association. This limits our activities to less than 4% of the original TP zone on the property. In the question of if multiple polygons are allowed, I would like to point out that on May 19th, 2020, Cal Fire approved a less than three acre conversion in Santa Cruz County with 13 exemption areas. So there is a, a precedent of multiple exemption areas. <laughs> Second, I would like to address the fact that we are not a cemetery. Cal State of California regulates burials and spreadings of ashes through its health and safety code. We've just heard about seven health and safety code 7003. Health and safety code 7116 clearly states Cremated remains or hydrolyzed human remains may be scattered in areas where no local prohibition exists, provided that the cremated remains or hydrolyzed human remains are not distinguished from the public, are not in a container, and the person who has control over disposition of the cremated remains has obtained written permission of the property owner. The key issue here, as defined by the Cemetery and Fun Funeral Bureau upon an investigation of our site in Mendocino, was that we do not bury ashes in containers, which would constitute a burial, we spread ashes. Therefore, 7116 applies and we are not a cemetery. Further, the scattering of cremated remains of more than one person in one location pursuant to the section shall not create a cemetery pursuant to section 003. So this is very clear. Once a body has been cremated and the ashes have been returned to a family, commercial spreading of ashes is regulated by the CFB's licensing of cremated remains disposers who spread ashes on private land with permission of the landowner. Pursuant to the Health and Safety Code, Better Place Forest has operated our forest in Mendocino, California since 2017. Hundreds of spreadings have occurred and all spreadings are handled by licensed cremated remains disposers and it is not a cemetery. The Cemetery and Funeral Bureau, Funeral Bureau has visited our site in Mendocino and investigated our spreading practices and the use of memorial markers in detail and determined that that site is not a cemetery. It is important to note that part of the reason for Health and Safety Code 7116 is that families have been spreading ashes throughout California for generations, quite likely all throughout Santa Cruz County, including in the timber zone and SU zone. HS 7116 exempts those places where those ashes were spread from being classified as cemeteries, because redefining a cemetery today would likely create hundreds, if not thousands, of de facto cemeteries within Santa Cruz County. Better Place Forest will create economic opportunity in Santa Cruz County, and we will work to be a partner of the Santa Cruz community. We'll bring more than 70 forestry contractor jobs to the property as part of the restoration efforts and development efforts. We'll contribute the tax benefits of being in the timber zone back to the community by contributing those same funds towards fire mitigation in the area. And we have committed to updating all the roads and infrastructure to the site to make sure that it will be available and maintained with increased safety and security for every, everyone who lives in that community. Our staff love living here and the families who choose Better Place Forest are part of the Santa Cruz community. Uh, families have made reservations for this property. All of those are full pre-sale agreements with all funds being refunded to those families should this project not move forward. But these are families that know this and wanted this project to be possible. They believe in this because they really want to be a part of Santa Cruz forever. And we hope that we can make that possible. With that said, I would like to bring Justin Kaufman forward to speak about the forestry practices on the property. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sandy. My name is Justin Kaufman. I'm a forester with NCRM, contracted with Better Place Forests. Been working in forestry since 2002, beginning as a student and a logger, but also come from a family with a history of ranching and logging. Been with NCRM for almost 10 years now, a certified arborist for five years and a registered professional forester for four. 
worked on numerous CAL FIRE projects over that time, permitting timber harvest plans, NTMPs, exemptions, and so on. And also, our firm has been involved in a number of projects in the area, including the San Vicente project with Save the Redwoods League, the restoration of Wonderlick Park with PG&E, and various restoration and public access trails projects with Mid Peninsula Open Space District, San Mateo RCD, and City of Saratoga. I've been working with Better Place Forest for over four years, uh, two years on the Santa Cruz project specifically. I'm confident that BPF is committed to working with the county to ensure that the majority of this property can remain viable for timber production. BPF is definitely fully aware that timber management is a necessity, not only to promote forest health, but to do their part in increasing the community fire resiliency. Their plan will allow the forest to be feasibly harvested using the existing infrastructure from the 2014 harvest. I've reviewed the old THP, explored the property, and have been involved in their planning process from the beginning to make sure that we're still able to harvest timber on the parcel. And with that, the proposal that was in front of you was obviously developed with timber harvest in mind. We plan on leaving all of the existing infrastructure and the three acre, less than three acre conversion areas have intentionally avoided harvest infrastructure. And between those polygons, we have left sufficient space to be able to harvest trees in between. So the, the areas in between those polygons are not functionally converted. And with logging around some of those converted memorial areas, there are many methods that are commonly used to avoid sensitive features. You know, certain sensitive things that would normally be avoided in a logging project would be a, a sensitive plant population, a threatened or endangered species, cultural resources, utilities, structures, other property improvements. So using these same methods that people use to avoid these type of features to use to avoid our memorials, we could use directional felling and things like heel booms and feller bunchers that lift the logs to be harvested away and not drag it across the ground and then we won't be disturbing any memorial areas. And for a future commercial harvest, obviously BPF would have to get a THP through CAL FIRE and that would include all the measures that we would use to you know, avoid any sensitive things on the site, including our memorial areas. So in closing, the proposed improvements should not have an impact on logging. The infrastructure will remain. We've intentionally avoided areas that would potentially you know, block off this existing harvest infrastructure. And just another note about the, the multiple conversion area polygons, as Sandy noted, it, it has been done in the past, both in the state and in Santa Cruz County and preliminary conversations with CAL FIRE didn't allude to any issues with our proposal. And with that, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Next, we'll hear from uh, the party uh, opposed to the application. You'll have a total of 10 minutes. You can break it up with two people or whatever, as long as it's a total of 10 minutes. Okay. Just a, a point of clarification before I get started. Uh, so if uh, we have a 10 minute, if I have a 10 minute total, I can defer some of that if I don't use the 10 minutes, is that correct, uh, uh, Chair? If you wanted to speak like for six minutes and the next person has uh, four minutes. Okay. Yeah, uh, total attempt. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll probably take advantage of that. <laughs> all right, thank okay. you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is David Van Lennep. I'm a registered professional forester. I've been working in Santa Cruz Mountains for about 27 years. And I'm here to speak with you today to try and um, address some of the issues uh, that we have with this project overall. Um, we continue to strongly believe that the proposed spreading of cremains and designated memorial trees raises numerous legal questions and has some potential irreversible impacts uh, on the landscape. The proposed use um, is, is more akin to a cemetery in terms of its actual function and the actual 
function that goes on. Uh, if you read in the state's legal de definitions of cemetery businesses, you will find uh, a lot of critical overlapping points with, with the function of what Better Place Forest does is as a cemetery and you will, if you read the definitions and the mission statements of many of the camps and schools and places that they've mentioned, you don't find much overlap with, with what Better Place Forest does. These places do not uh, sell memorial trees. They do not uh, spread the cremated remains of, of people on the ground uh, contractually. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a broad difference. Uh, and I, I believe that staff uh, outlined uh, the, some of the, the vagaries and um, I guess lack of specificity in the law very well for your board to, to try and discern and have that discussion amongst yourselves. But I think the function of, of what they're actually doing is important for the board to understand more than what they call it or don't call it. Staff identified the permanent nature of the remains that, that will exist on site uh, after those remains have been spread. And that's irrespective of monuments or, or trees or anything else. And contractually speaking, you know, the, those, those families have forever places. Those families are, are, are there and they have an, an emotional tether to that land and things that go along with them, uh, along with that land are important to them. And, we just don't see that there's a, a good overlap between timber harvesting, regardless of how, how you may or may not do it, and, and cremated remains and memorial, uh, memorial trees and designated places. Uh, to, to get to Supervisor Caput's uh, question, um, I think that what the question you were wondering about is not whether they've scattered, but whether how many contracts have been sold and I believe that we've, we've been told or heard that there were several hundred contracts that have been sold on the property already. So they have several hundred potential clients that they're trying to serve with, with this three acre exemption. Uh, and that is, that is, I think, one of the reasons for this, the spread out nature of the three acre exemptions. Uh, if, if you were, as a landowner, trying to minimize your impact on your ability to harvest timber and reduce the footprint of your building or your, your three acre conversion area, you wouldn't spread it out over about 15 acres. Uh, you wouldn't complicate the harvest of those interstitial spaces with polygons of preserved areas. And uh, looking at their polygon map, and I haven't reviewed the new polygon map, and I, so I don't know how different the new polygon map is. The conversion exemption is designed to allow a landowner a non-timber use, a small, minor, non-timber use of their property. And it should not inhibit the growing and harvesting uh, in between. So if you tight line those polygons and you draw a line around the outside edge, you get a footprint of about 14 acres. And there, there may be some opportunity to do something in between, but there's also streams lakes, there's a little pond in there, areas that by forest practice rules, you can't fall trees into or against, and you will have to, you will have to exclude those areas, and you will not be able to operate in between those areas if you have polygons on both sides. So there's certainly, certainly more than three acres uh, with this current map that will be uh, profoundly impacted and de facto converted by the way these polygons are shaped. Uh, the 15 acre footprint was our quick uh, sort of overall footprint of the area that could be affected. But it gives an idea that there's more than three acres. And the exemption process is designed to, uh, to not require a landowner to go through a timberland conversion process, which is a very long drawn out permit like a timber harvest plan, to allow them their use of three acres for a house, a barn, or something else. It's not designed to allow a landowner to systematically go through and pick out spots on their property to extract the highest value out of. That's not the intent of the exemption process. And uh, the exemption that they offered up in their explanation uh, was done on the city of Santa Cruz lands around Newell, 
uh, around uh, Newell Creek, the Loch Lomond Reservoir, and was done for infrastructure reasons. They had no choice but to isolate several areas for construction of new pipeline. Uh, it was separated by a dam and the reservoir on two sides couldn't log logically be connected. So certainly apples and oranges, the process is designed to be flexible and allow people to utilize it to achieve a goal. The intended purpose of a three, less than three acre conversion exemption is not to allow someone to go through, systematically pick out the highest value part of their property and circle it and do something with it. Now in this case, they're, they're not going to do anything but scatter, but often and in other places, uh, those processes have been abused where people go through their property and they pick out the biggest trees and they circle them and they exempt them and then they cut them. And I don't believe that Cal Fire has been uh, very forgiving of that use of the exemption. Regardless of the conversion permit, if this board chooses to move forward with this permit in some way, shape or form, whether it's three acres in some format or, or uh, some other format that the board chooses, the involvement with the Bureau of the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau on the specifics of this project would be important. Um, Ms. Cramblett indicated that there had been some communication with the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau. Uh, if, if it's referring, if she's referring to the letter that was provided by the applicant in 2018 or anything that the applicant has forwarded or, or put forth, it would be incumbent on this board to involve the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau on the very specific nature of the things that are specifically being asked to be done on this project and should not rely on something from 2018 on another piece of property with another zoning and with a whole uh, possibly different set of scenarios. So if the board moves forward, I think that that would be a wise and reasonable thing to do is to have staff consult with the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau directly about the specifics of what's being proposed on the ground. Uh, general plan clarifications. I would also ask that the general plan be amended, uh, the staff be directed to construct amendments to the general plan that show that this use for commercial businesses and commercial scattering is not compatible on a TPZ. Uh, again, irrespective of the decision that's made uh, in this particular situation, I would ask that that clarification, that clarity be given to staff and potential uh, businesses going forward. And I think that's what I have to say. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, you can go ahead and stop the time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? You, you have somebody else going to speak? Yes. Thank you. How much time do they have? Supervisor Cabot, is this minute in addition to the three minutes I'm going to take uh, later? Because if, if it's one or the other, I prefer to use my three minutes later. So give them the full four minutes. Give them the full four. Yeah, yeah, take, four take the full okay. four. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I begin, um, Supervisor Caput, Supervisor Leopold, uh, and the three supervisors who aren't in attendance under these difficult circumstances. I'm Bob Berlage, uh, representing Big Creek Lumber Company. This is my 47th year in the forest products industry, the last 37 of which were working for Big Creek Lumber. I, I, think, I think it's fair and very important for your board to look at the common sense aspects of this proposal. For an entire year, the applicant has claimed 
somewhat vaguely in their application with planning department that they intended to harvest timber without any details during that same year on social media to anyone and everyone, presumably their potential clients also claiming that they were never going to cut their trees. One of those things is true and one isn't, they can't both be true. And consequently, if you think about what they're proposing, the only thing that makes any sense is that they're never going to cut their trees. If you refer to the map on page 117, it's attachment 12F, and look at that polygon, despite what their forester says, our company has hundreds of years of experience on the ground, owners, registered professional foresters, and woods operators. Nobody's ever going to get a permit inside those polygons to cut timber. In, there are methods to cut trees, to try and get them where you want. It's an inexact science. I did that job for 21 years and I got pretty good at it. And frankly, a lot better than what I do now, standing up in front of you. Logging was, was scary. Uh, standing up in front of you is a different kind of scary, but it's preposterous to think anybody would go in there and log between those polygons. You've got trees that are 150 feet tall, things go wrong, trees go over backwards. I don't know a singer, single timber faller in 47 years that didn't lose their trees sideways. They're going to skid logs in there in between those polygons and four out of the five former landings where logs would be dragged are inside that polygon footprint. We agree with Mr. Van Lennep that the actual area, and it would constitute a no harvest area, is the outside perimeter of that, of that ground. That's 15 acres on that property that will never ever get logged. If you did file a permit, Better Place Forest customers would scream bloody murder that you're about to defile the sacred remains of their, of their loved ones. Nobody's gonna do that. The reality of their footprint is more like 27 acres if you move far enough away from that polygon set to, to ensure to yourself that you weren't going to interfere with the sacred remains of loved ones. And happy to answer any questions, but the problem here is that they're asking you to bail them out of really poor business decisions. That's not the county's job. And our company doesn't want to be uh, collateral damage in a decision to do something they shouldn't be doing on TP land. Thank you. Chair, Chair Caput. Yes, sir. I just, I just wanted to ask for the clerk to clarify to make sure that both parties got the same amount of time. Uh, what I, would, I would like to confirm that for the record because there was a little back and forth on that and it wasn't clear. Um, no, the um, Big Creek got an extra four minutes. Big Creek got an extra four minutes? Correct, this last, the last speaker got an, well, actually an extra three minutes and three seconds. Okay, um, I, would, I, would, I would recommend that that three minutes and two seconds be added on to the applicant's ability Absolutely. to speak so that so okay. that- Okay, uh, I, I thought it was a care. total of 10, but they still have three minutes, huh? No, I, I think what the, I think the issue is, is that when uh, Mr. Balaj spoke, he was used in the last minute of the, uh, of the uh, appellant's um, uh, time, and then he did his three minutes of that, that, that he was gonna give his public testimony. So I think that's why there's a three minute difference. And I'm not sure for the purposes of our council, whether that, um, whether that qualifies, Mr. Balaj is not gonna come up again and testify. 
So at this point, I would just ask the applicant to register that and let us know whether they have any problem right. with that so that we eliminate any, any issues for purposes of the record. Okay. Uh, if you want to speak, you have uh, about three minutes, right? Or, or you could just say, you understand and- It's up to you. I think you better come up to the microphone and say it so- uh... Uh, We understand and accept what Supervisor Leopold is recommending. Okay. Well, actually, you'll be coming up next anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, uh, the applicant has five minutes now uh, to respond to anything that may have been brought up or uh, whatever you want to say. Hi. Supervisors, Chair Caput, my name is Nandi Chabra, and I'm legal counsel um, and public affairs advisor at Better Place For Us, and I'll do the rebuttal on behalf of the company. Uh, I'll just address a few issues that were raised. Uh, first, as to the company's status, proposed status um, as, a, as a cemetery. Um, as you know, the, the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau has spoken to the issue. I just wanna read a couple lines from that letter. The Cemetery and Funeral Bureau has concluded its investigation into the complaint filed against Better Place Forest as an unlicensed cemetery. Upon review of the complaint and applicable- Excuse me for just a moment. Can you please cover your nose sure. too? Thank you. Sorry. Um, upon the review of the complaint and applicable documentation collected, there is insufficient evidence to support a violation of the Bureau's laws, rules, or regulations governing the operation of a cemetery in the state of California. We are closing our file on this matter with no further action. Secondly, um, the fact that what BPF is doing is special or unique does not mean that it is not allowed. Um, staff has worked hard to assess whether the proposed use is allowed within existing land uses and the ZA zoning administrator had arrived at a use, organized camps and, and facilities that was appropriate. In terms of conversations with customers, it is true that BPF initially did not intend to harvest the entire property. However, upon hearing the concerns and requests of stakeholders in the community, BPF agreed to do so as part of an effort to make concessions and listen to those in the community around it. In terms of the fact that BPF has arrangements with customers, contracts with customers, that should have no impact on the decision before the board today. There are agreements, it is true, that are pre-sales where refunds are possible if the project is not approved. Again, that bears no relation to the land use issue and application issues before the board in our opinion. With respect to conversion areas, um, I, will, I will defer to Justin Kaufman in a moment. Um, they have been specifically drawn to enable harvest, to preserve infrastructure and to comply with local regulations. Um, there is precedent for conversion areas in the past. Better Place Forest has looked to that precedent and has engaged with uh, Cal Fire for feedback, as well as professional foresters who, who, who are expert. Um, and we will continue to do so. We will continue to seek the best expertise we can find and, and seek the counsel of, of CAL FIRE and the regulators. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Justin for any additional comments. I just wanted to touch briefly on the feasibility of timber harvest in between the proposed con conversion polygons. I agree that Yes, fallers definitely do have issues. Trees get away from people. It's not an exact science. There's no one can dispute that. Um, one thing I would like to add though, is that there are lots of sensitive areas that can be within a timber harvest that would potentially be violations of, you know, Cal Fire, the Cal Fire Forest Practice Rules. And that's just a, a little bit of a risk that, you know, what's your acceptable level, level of risk on this? If you're, you know, working next to a cultural site or something like that, your follower is gonna take extra precautions to not hit that site, both, you know, for the ethical reasons of not wanting to destroy it, and also for the, the reasons of not wanting to get a violation of the law. So 
yes, you know, harvest in between these polygons may be increasingly difficult, but in no way is impossible. You know, we could, you can do many different things with rigging and different types of equipment in between these sensitive areas that definitely make it possible to remove the timber for a commercial purpose. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, are there any members of the public who wish to address the board on this item? Well, th doesn't he get five minutes? Oh, they, they don't. Okay. What? No. Sorry. I apologize. Uh, according to this, no, right? Yeah. Uh, so members of the public wish to address the board. Keep your comments to the matter of the application. Thank you. Hello, supervisors. Thank you. My name is uh, John Clark. I'm actually a local uh, landowner up there, and I've been following this process since it uh, since close after it started. So, just a couple of comments that I have about this is that to me, as as watching this from the outside, it looks a lot more like uh, the the act. I know they just said that they're not considering the activities of cemetery, but it looks a lot more like the activities of a cemetery, especially given the volumes that these guys are talking about trying to sell. It's not just going to be a couple of areas where they dispose of the cremated remains, but in the hundreds and possibly even thousands. Um, there's a lot of money involved in that, uh, according to you know what they're charging there. So the thing that really disturbs me about this is that as a landowner, I have my land value at stake here because if the public starts to see this as a burial ground or a cemetery, and say, for example, I want to go sell my property and they find out about this because now I have to disclose this within my uh, real estate disclosures, it could potentially devalue my property and surrounding properties around there. So the question that I have is like, what's my recourse as a landowner, excuse me, I'm trying to deal with the mask here, what's, the, what's my recourse as a landowner if that were to happen? I don't think I'm going to have very much because it'd be very difficult for me to go after them legally because I've backed very well financially, especially if they sell this amount of, uh, uh, you know, this, you know, sites of uh, cremation remain sites there. So um, my opinion on this is that it's closer to a cemetery. I would personally like to see it be regulated as a cemetery. Maybe it's a, a new classification that's created, but some kind of regulation and accountability on their part so that they can't get away with doing something that causes harm to others and then they can make all the profit and they can just take off whenever they're, they're done doing whatever they wanna do with their land. So, um, so the question I have is what's the recourse for any kind of negative land value effect, which I just brought up. Um, I think this is gonna be seen as a bare ground. Um, one of the other items I was thinking is, is there's been no discussion about some kind of a bond for the purpose of protecting surrounding landowners or issues that might come up uh, for this thing. And then what's the liability of the county and state for cleanup if they say decide to abandon the property or sell it, leaving all this on, on site? Is that gonna cause a problem in the future? Um, and then the other thing that comes up for me is, this is really at the bottom line, it's a real estate company. So they're selling, they're buying property to monetize it. And it's private land, it's not a preservation. And I'm curious about how this land is being protected because I hear, hear a lot of stuff about how the land is being protected. And um, what really, as a landowner, what I would like to see, even though I don't necessarily like the idea of having a burial ground close by, regardless of what they call it, um, I would like to see it be rezoned or resubdivided and rezoned as a public facilities district and have some kind of regulation, at least some kind of regulation so it's not just free for them to make up their mind as to how they're gonna do it. Because uh, everybody surrounding, like I say, has a liability stake in this. Um, so anyways, my time's almost up. So that's my piece. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Arnett Young. I'm uh, the first vice president of the Farm Bureau. And I'm here to discuss about the, the Better Place uh, Forestry or our Better Place uh, uh, Memorial Site. The reason I'm uh, up here today is uh, two reasons. One, uh, we do see it as a cemetery. It is the, the internment of, uh, and that's using their language, internment of loved ones uh, concentrated in one site. So it is being operated as a cemetery. Therefore it should be regulated as a cemetery. The second, second uh, portion is uh, talking about the polygon, polygons. This is a timber harvest zone and it's specifically set up and set aside for that. And there is that three acre limitation uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, development. However, it's not, I don't think it was an ever intended to be, be able to 
circle in trees, which is the production zone for timber harvest circle, and then keep them for eternity and taking it out of production. Um, so those are really our two concerns and we'd like the board to address this. Uh, really, that's all I have to say. And uh, if there's any questions, no, nope. thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I live just down the, the street, uh, Dove Lane, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And thank you for opening this up to the public. Uh, my husband and I own nine acres, and it's a beautiful area there. I just wanted to point out a couple of things. If you take a look at the social media sites and platforms that A Better Place Forest utilizes, specifically for customer reviews, they define themselves as funeral services and cemeteries. So I don't know if you know that. In addition, if you look at their website, <clears throat> they describe themselves with words like tombstones, cemetery, final resting place. And, and you kind of have to in this business model, otherwise you're not gonna get someone to spend five to $18,000 for a tree just to say a prayer or learn about the redwoods. It all mixes, right? So. I, I'm here because I'm concerned about a few things. I'm concerned about someone coming and lighting a memorial candle and leaving it unattended. I'm concerned about fire. I'm concerned about someone driving up Eureka Canyon Road, which is in some areas, it's only one lane. We've had so many instances where people don't respect the road. They don't know how to drive it. They're from out of town. and and just we had two two people just die a couple of months ago. That, that's just not good for the community. There's no Wi-Fi service up there. So if there is an emergency, they won't be, they'll have to go knock on the door of a neighbor if, if, if it's not gated. It's just, I, I'm concerned. Fire, the traffic, the potential traffic. Um, sorry, my mask keeps going down and I'm nervous. I've never spoken before a board before, so sorry. You're doing um, fine. Thanks. I, I just I, I just have concerns. I think it's a really sweet plan, honestly, to to have someone like that. But it, I think it should be in a, a proper cemetery. And I know there's a code for that. PF. This is a timberland that it, it just doesn't seem to mesh with me, and I'm I'm concerned. So I I probably was not articulate enough. But thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. I hope I can read this without my glasses. Um, I'm just here, my name is Cynthia Getchman. I'm here as a concerned citizen. I live on Eureka Canyon Road, also in the Buzzard Lagoon area. And I do understand that this company, I've done a little bit of research and that they, I, I guess they've sold all these 500 plots to their customers um, in Santa Cruz County um, on this plot without having a, a business license. I thought you had to have a business license in order to sell, I, you don't? So I could sell anything with anywhere here and not have a business license? We don't have business licenses in the county of Santa Cruz. Okay, or permits or anything? I can just sell anything? Okay, so anyway, so you know, I can appreciate their information and their statistics on the environmental impact and the the logging and, and everything else in the county. But I, what I didn't hear at all actually was a, a traffic impact, with a, a traffic study on Eureka, on Highland, on Buzzard, which I don't know if you guys have been up there to their plot where a notice of proposed development sign was placed, which nobody can see. I have pictures of it, if, if you'd like to see those later. It's about a half mile in on a dirt fire road, which is Buzzard Lagoon. Nobody can see it from the main road. And um, it's a two lane, one lane road that like she said, is you can't even commute on it. So it's very dangerous. And I don't see how they're gonna get 500 plus people in and out of there. 
on a dirt road, especially in the winter time. Um, it's, it's designed, that road is only designed for hiking, biking, and a fire road by Cal Fire. So I'm, I'm not sure what their plan is, but as, you know, as a landowner and a parent up there, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to speak today here. Um, kind of piggybacking on that uh, note, um, we are probably the closest neighbors to this property and we only learned about this project about six months ago because we happened to be walking our dog in that uh, dirt road. Um, we were not sent, uh, and I don't believe any of our neighbors were sent any notices. No one knew about this project. Um, and it's a very significant project. In fact, it's kind of a legacy land use model, um, which is gonna have social consequences for many, many years. Um, so that's uh, one of the things I was concerned about. Um, Another one is with the uh, increasing numbers of clients and families. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. With the increasing numbers of clients and families that are going to be serviced over, uh, over time uh, with this model, um, I'm not really, uh, I don't really quite understand why w uh, we don't have to have a, a, a CEQA for this, this project, some sort of um initial study at least for the environment for the environment the traffic and um everything um especially since now it's i assume it's a discretionary project um uh, since it's now in front of the, the board of supervisors um and it is a, a novel land use um it hasn't been done before so we don't know what the effects of having the, the cremains and that, that amount in a certain concentrated area might be on the environment and so forth. There's a pH involved in, in soils and all this stuff that might be, uh, I, I don't know if there's studies on this or not, but um, that's another concern. Uh, the other one other people have talked about, of course, are the traffic and safety and the county services. We have very, very, little access to fire and the sheriff. Sometimes it, it takes about 30 minutes for them to get there, um, sometimes an hour. Um, and um, how are uh, a better place far as gonna be enforcing their visitors in this area um, and trespassing and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, as a neighbor, as one of the closest neighbors there, I, I have a lot of concerns about people coming up um, consistently and having this grow and grow and be uh, a bigger and bigger um, project over time um, with, without much uh, initial study or anything like that through CEQA or, you know. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. You're, you're welcome, very welcome. Anyone else uh, here in the chambers? Uh, anyone downstairs? Uh, anyone on? No one, one here side? can speak. Oh, do you want to speak, sir? Come on. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, my name is John Swift, and um, I would like to say that I am a licensed real estate agent, land use planner, and was an appraiser for quite some time. And I have developed a couple of properties around cemeteries. Now, this property is not a cemetery, as defined by the state law. It's been demonstrated time and time again that this is very different. The spreading of ashes is done throughout the state, throughout the county. There is no regulation about the spreading of ashes. But I do want to say in, my, in the role of a real estate agent and past appraiser that I have never seen uh, a, a, that type of use being a de resulting in the devaluation of adjacent property. I developed a property on Capitola Road right adjacent to, I believe it's called the Holy Cross Cemetery. We'd had no problem, no one they considered it a desirable open space use by the most part. So I, I never had anybody ex, uh, express that that was a devaluation. In terms of maintaining the property, uh, more than even a single family residence, these people are commercially and, and motivated to maintain this property, to keep it looking good in essence, to keep the fire hazard down, 
they have rules to say that you cannot have open flames or a candle. Uh, so different than a house that may have a fire, a bonfire, a fire pit. These are, these are reasons why this use is probably less impactful than a single family dwelling with an ADU, with a junior ADU, with a hobby space and everything else. Uh, in terms of traffic, uh, the, someone mentioned that there would be 500 people there. There's not 500 people there at any one time. The conditions are very clear. The limitation is 30 people at one time. And it's extremely unlikely that that number will be reached many, most of the time. I mean, during the winter time, there will be virtually no visitations occurring when the weather is bad and the, and the roads are problematic. They have agreed to maintain the road as specified in the conditions. Uh, CEQA was reviewed as a categorical exemption, level three and uh, level five, level four rather, as small landscape type facilities and small structures. So that's a very common CEQA evaluation of a project of this nature. Um, is it possible for uh, the CEO of the company to respond to some of the uh, concerns and issues raised? I think there's some, some misunderstandings that would be, would I think we all would benefit from some clarification. Uh, is that uh, protocol? For, yes, okay, thank you. Thank you, I just wanna take one moment to address the question of, again, our status. Uh, we're very clearly not a cemetery in California. And in terms of advertising and social media sites, uh, Better Place Forest is very clear. We are regulated by the states, by the state of California that we cannot refer to ourselves as a cemetery or providing cemetery services. The reason we are regulated that way is specifically because we are not a cemetery. We are an open space. We create conservation memorial forests. Uh, and in those forests, only spreading is allow, allowed. Any reference to funeral services is specific to the created, cremated remains disposer licenses that our staff have when they provide cremated remains disposition work. In terms of the ongoing care and maintenance of our forests, each of our forests we work with local land trusts to put conservation easements on uh, and to work with the local community to protect those forests. We also create a separate endowment fund so those, the funds, the forest will have access to those funds. Uh, so it's very important to note that this is, a, this is stewarded land uh, we are committing to active timber harvest on the property because that is important to this community. Uh, and while initially some of our early marketing may have said, and an architect who was involved with the project said that timber would not be allowed, in this project, that is different. We've specifically updated all of our customer contracts to be clear that commercial timber will be required on this property for its ongoing care and maintenance and as part of the long-term viability for this forest. So this is something that while initially we did not intend to do, when we heard it was a concern to the community, we committed to it. Same as the less than three acre conversion. When we heard that it was a concern to the timber industry of this community, that they didn't want a precedent of ashes being spread on active timber land. We said, we hear you, we understand, and we will only spread ashes within converted areas, specifically because we wanna demonstrate that we wanna work with this community, we wanna create good jobs in this community, and we wanna give the families of this community who wanna spend forever here, the chance to do so. So I thank you again for all of your consideration on this project. Uh, it's been a long two years of work, working with staff, addressing all of these issues. But I just wanna reiterate, we are very clearly not a cemetery and the specific program we have suggested of only spreading in converted areas is specifically to address the concerns of timber. So there would not be a precedent of ashes being spread in active timber areas. This sets that precedent so that it is clear that our operations are limited to that area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair Caput. Yeah. Chair Caput, yes. I would recommend that you ask the, uh, the opponents whether they would like equal time to come up and respond to those questions because we departed from our normal procedure in allowing that to happen. Thank you, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, we understand that there's a, a, a very, uh, there's a thin line uh, of whether or not legally, uh, as state law currently exists, whether or not a Better Place Forest is a conservation area or a, or a cemetery or spreading forest. Um, 
So two, two things that I would, I would just like to conclude with that. Um, first, uh, look at the use. Uh, the law, I don't believe, uh, I believe staff did a very good job of outlining some of the, some of the, the inconsistencies and, and lack of specificity in the law. And I, I think the board should really have that discussion and, and decide whether they believe this has to do with memorial services and funeral, uh, not funeral, uh, cemetery business or not and, and make that decision. Uh, and if you choose to go forward, uh, then please get a, a specific uh, opinion from the cemetery and, and funeral bureau. Uh, the, the letter that they are offering certainly applies to their Mendocino forest on non-TPZ and is not in any way, shape or form directly related to what's being proposed here today. Uh, so I would ask that there's no harm and, and probably only benefit that can come from establishing from the state that they're in fact operating within the confines of the law. They'll make the, the county feel much better about what they're doing if, they, if you choose to go forward with this. And also we'll give the, the county some guidelines on making sure that there's a proper endowment for the property, proper long-term care. I mean, I'm sure that the Better Place Forest has, has great designs and great visions, but sometimes those don't work out. It's a business. And if they decide that they're done with this property, um, I think it, that's why cemeteries, uh, formal cemeteries have endowments. That's why they have long-term care programs. That's why those things exist. That's why the state's involved in regulation of those, of those entities. And uh, I think that was my, my concluding point. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um. Any web comments? Yes, we have two web comments. Thank you. The first one is from um, Becky Steinbrenner. Dear Board of Supervisors, I am not confident that I am successful. Oh. Please include my comment below for your consideration of the matter. Please deny application 818-1856 because it would allow a cemetery with markers to be established as a prohibited commercial use on land zoned for timber preserve. Bending the rules now to allow a cemetery on this land would effectively forever prohibit timber harvest at the site due to the issue of human remains known to exist on the land. Although the applicant insists the proposed cemetery site would only be available by appointment, there is no possible insurance that families of loved ones whose remains would be located marked at the site would not take liberty to visit the site night or day and possibly leave candles or incense burning on the site. This increases the fire risk to the rural property owners nearby as well as the SoCal State Demonstration Forest and Forest of Nicene Marks. Application 181556 constitutes a commercial use prohibited for the parcel zone to preserve. Please deny the application. And the second one is from Robert Singleton. Please provide, I'm sorry, please approve the pro project proposed by Better Place Forest. Not only is the project a unique commercial offering, but it is a spiritual vision that allows for people to remember their lost loved ones in a very special and personal way. Beyond, beyond the inherent merits of the proposal, Bear, Better Place Forest has gone above and beyond what is required of them and have made a continuous and per persistent effort to work with other community partners and the existing timber harvest. The project conforms to the limit exemption zone and will ha have virtually no impact on the other timber harvesting stakeholders. They will, however, work to maintain a f the forest safely and actively reduce wildfire risk. This project is also explicitly not a cemetery a re as recognized by California law and any association between these specific uses is misleading and perhaps disingenuous. Lastly, the project will bring jobs to Santa Cruz County and not just low paying service and agricultural jobs, but career opportunities and environmental stewardship and forest management. Overall, the project is very much in line with the values of Santa Cruz County and our business community. Better Place Forest is a collaborative partner and we are excited to have them as, local, as a local company. Please approve this project. Chair, I Thank have uh, yes. I, I have some additional questions okay. here, if that's okay. Uh, Supervisor um, uh, Leopold. You know, one of the things uh, when I first became aware of this as it went to the Planning Commission, after the Planning Commission gave made its decision and 
um, uh, when we took this up at our board, um, the big concern that I heard was about working lands, that TP uh, zone land uh, should be used for timber production. Um, and that, that it was important that we not give up the limited amount of space that we have for TP uh, for some other use. And so when I heard that this proposal was coming in, that it was uh, using, that, w that had scaled back its uh, uh, proposal uh, to only use a limited portion of the TP the land and basically do everything on this SU land, I thought that that was a good idea. Um, the concern was raised about whether it's, this is actually harvestable land, right? I won't pretend like I know. I, I've heard uh, from uh, those that I know in forestry, I've heard from another person in forestry, the differing opinions. Um, I understand that, that uh, Rich Sampson from CAL FIRE has been involved in some of these discussions. And so I asked him to be on the call today so he could ask, so he could answer the questions about its, its viability. And uh, I think uh, Rich is, is still on the line here on the team's call. And Rich, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to take a look at this uh, project um, or, or know about a project, but this idea of the polygons and, and harvesting around the polygons, is that something that's done? Is it possible? Uh, have you looked at this? This is Rich Sampson, can you hear me okay? So we've, we've seen the uh, polygon map. Uh, we've seen similar maps on similar projects. Um, is it feasible? Uh, we, it's been done in the past. The property is timberland. It had a timber harvest plan on it in 2014, I believe. And so it would be slated for, or it'd be eligible for another timber harvest uh, in about another seven years. Uh, so it is it is viable timberland. It's not uh, the best timberland in the county, I would, would admit, but it is it is timberland that could have harvest into the future. As to whether it's feasible to have a commercial harvest uh, in, be in, those, in between the polygons, um, I would say it is feasible. Uh, but I would have to see the actual application uh, in front of us. The, uh, uh, as I mentioned to staff and to the proponent, I would actually have to see the actual permit application for a conversion before I can answer that. This conversion application would have to go to Cal Fire before anything could actually happen on this site. Is that correct? Yeah. The way it normally works in, in, well, the way it works in Santa Cruz County is uh, we would need county planning. There's a county planning rep that signs conversion permits before it's sent over to uh, Cal Fire for our review. So the, the county would have to approve it first and then we would review it. And if everything is in place and it met the rules um, for the full form and it was accurate, well, then we would uh, be able to approve it. Okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate you being available. He and I haven't talked before, but I understand there was conversation with him, so I wanted to make sure he was available. So I'm gonna ask a question I don't know whether you know the answer of, but uh, there is a similar type. This, this uh, business has a business in Mendocino County. And has there been, are you aware of any issues that Cal Fire has been involved with with that property? When this came up about six months ago, I asked my counterpart up there and he was not even aware that there was a property like that uh, or that use was occurring. But on the other hand, uh, my understanding is that property is not zoned TPZ. So uh, I don't know what that property looks like. It may or may not be timberland for all I know. Well, Rich, I appreciate the work that you do every day. Thanks for helping at least me answer a question. I'm not sure if my colleagues will have any questions for you. You know, the question of uh, whether this is can be working lands has been the thing that has been driving me in terms of my analysis of this project. Um, 
because uh, I respect the fact that, that we've had lots of battles over uh, uh, timber here in Santa Cruz County, that we've come to a place that, um, that we have uh, what I call a truce, that there are, it's clear where it, could, it happened and not happened. There's a clear set of rules. Um, to me, this, this project is better than what could happen at that, pro, at, at that site. If someone were able to come and say, I like this spot, I wanna be a homeowner there, they could create that three acre exemption and never have to file a timber harvest plan. Whereas this one, we are actually getting someone to fire, uh, file a timber harvest plan. Um, and we may disagree about how much they will get and wh whether that'll be effective, but that's a lot better than what we would get otherwise. Um, this new thing about the cemetery, it's, it's new. Um, this, this use is a slightly unusual, um, but the question from people about whether it's a cemetery and whether it should be regulated like a cemetery because cemeteries have rules. I can just tell you from my experience in my district, even a state regulated cemetery can have lots of problems. And if you look to the, 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 the uh, cemetery in the village of Soquel, that's where people from the civil war are buried. Uh, we had to do a lot of work to put that in the hands of someone who would do better care of it than what happened because the, that, the, the person who ran that cemetery spent the endowment and then caused lots of problems. And we've now have it in the hands of folks who are better managing that property and allowing people to bury their, their loved ones. And in that case, they're burying actual bodies. They're not, it's not a, a cream, there is a crematorium on the, on the site, uh, but most of them are actual burials. This seems very different to me. Um, if I were to have cremated remains of, of uh, a family member and uh, that person wanted to be uh, spread out on somewhere that they loved, whether it be trees, the ocean, uh, their favorite ball field or something, that does happen. Um, the impact to the environment, I think, is, is fairly minimal. Uh, these are the, the, the amount of ashes would have to be so extraordinary as to, to create some kind of environmental hazard. I don't think that that's a reasonable question. Um, I've been uh, convinced by the letter I read about uh, from this, uh, the, the, the state agency about whether it's a cemetery or not, that it's not a cemetery. I don't think that we, that, uh, we need to re-litigate that. Um, I do think that for the concerns of the neighbors, uh, that uh, there is a real hard limit on the number of visitors the number of cars, the fact that you can't have any candles or things that are lighted. Those are conditions of this project. Um, I, would, I would caution to, to those who say you should, we should rezone this as public facilities land because that carries with it a whole bunch of other uh, things. Uh, one, just to, just to give you an idea of the range is if you're zoned P, PF or public facilities, you have a by right uh, um, option to create a homeless shelter there. Just one example. So PF is not, is not some, uh, um, some panacea. It's, it, it will, it's another level of, uh, of issues. I do wanna ask a question to the proponents about the questions of staffing. You know, the, the concerns that people are gonna come here and do things and, and not be able to follow rules. Can someone answer me the question of staffing? Uh, so the, the forest is staffed full time, uh, as well as uh, we've added in Wi-Fi to the site powered by solar. So there's always access for emergency information and emergency issues. Uh, appoint visitation is by appointment only. So the gate is locked except for during appointments. And we do have security cameras on the site as well. Uh, so we are, this is from the, the standpoint of better place forest versus not a better place forest. This site is far more secure uh, has staffing full time to report any issues. Of course, in terms of issues like traffic, we have agreed to traffic limitations and there is a full fire ban on the site. And again, customers can only be on the site and their families can only be on the site when staff are present. So it is fully staffed to ensure that all these safety issues are there. And on the question of the maintenance of the road, what's your understanding of what your responsibility is for that road? Uh, we are committed to make sure that road is fully, is, is accessible at all times. And if there are any issues with that road, we will have to fix them. 
How does, that, can, does that mean changing it to, to something more than, than the condition it's in now? It's just making sure it maintains a, a high condition is always right, drivable. So it's going to be more accessible for fire services than it would be today because we will commit to always maintaining that road. All right, thank you. Um, I think that when you have, uh, a, for lack of a better term, a novel use as this, which is something that uh, I'm not sure anybody in the room had thought of five years ago, maybe he did, but, uh, but, but most of us didn't think of of uh, spreading ashes five years ago on uh, land as a business opportunity, it is hard to, that our code can capture all the um, uh, the ways in which people imagine to use land. Um, uh, when I first heard about this as a camp, uh, I questioned whether that was an appropriate designation uh, given what was being done here. Uh, but as I looked at it, uh, I couldn't find a better way to, to, to look. There wasn't another box that it, that, uh, it fit in that, that made sense to me. Um, I do think that going forward, that if should we approve this, I think there's two things that would be useful. Um, one is that uh, we probably do want some general plan language to not allow this in the future, so we don't have to have this conflict in the future. Um, and two is to think about if this is gonna go on in other land, does there need to be appropriate setbacks or other conditions that are there? Because now that it's in our sphere, um, should there be things that we look at? I don't, I'm not, I don't know what, if that should be, but I think that it would be useful for us to start thinking about this so we're not caught unaware in the, in the future. I would be prepared to move uh, the conditions of approval um, as outlined in attachment, let's make sure I get the right one. Uh, attachment C, findings for approval, uh, that I would add an additional condition to direct the staff uh, to draft language to, for a general plan designation to not allow this kind of use in the future. And also request that the staff report back to us um, if there are additional uh, language that we should add to the code about this kind of use in other zoned areas. I will second. Uh, this is Supervisor Friend. I have some additional thoughts on this. Um, I appreciate Supervisor Leopold's comments. I actually appreciate what everybody came up to say because it it really has helped inform the discussion and decision-making process. Um, I, I think I, I want to expand on and see whether Supervisor Leopold may be willing to do this. I'd like to expand a little bit upon the motion because I think that what we need is actually clarity of where cremated remains can go in general. Right now the code is silent on it. And I think that what we could do on the second part of the motion, if you're amenable, is actually direct staff to come back with the zoning locations that it would be acceptable on, because then that would, at least in this new sphere, settle that component. On the first element, though, uh, to be specific to how I interpreted your motion, uh, what I think the board is is has been saying, both when we took jurisdiction and, and now under the current comments we're making right now, TPZ is land that has had pretty significant fights over it that should be settled. Uh, the board is not interested. I'm not interested. And I think that we need to make it very clear in an update uh, so that this level of interpretation can't occur moving forward. This is not a criticism of planning staff at all. Right now, uh, there isn't clarity in the code. And so one can look at a novel use and say, well, it's not ex expressly prohibited and therefore it's it's permitted or you could actually uh, make a different conclusion, but I think that the board needs to make a more formal statement that timber zone is for timber harvesting. I mean, that's what it's for. Other commercial activities are not the kind of activities, irrespective of what it is, whether it's this activity or a different kind of activity, we need to be uh, pretty restrictive of what other commercial activities. So I would be supportive of a general plan uh, of an amendment that comes forward that really does limit what's possible on TP, TBZ land. But the second part of it, if Supervisor Leopold is amenable, is I think that the, we need to actually come back with zoning information of where uh, cremated remains can actually go. And then the second component of that is the parameters within those zones of what would be acceptable. 
I'm comfortable with that as an amendment. Um, Chairman Caput, this is Supervisor McPherson. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see they were making some additions and uh, by Supervisors uh, Leopold and Friend. Um, I do want to thank our Planning Department Commission for all its work uh, and what they, the applicant for downsizing its proposal. Uh, seldom do we have a staff recommendation for denial or for approval at the same time, uh, but this is a complicated issue. Um, I'm um, concerned about the precedent setting nature of this, and I think that we can address those with the amendments that have been mentioned, uh, or the motion and amendments that have been mentioned. Um, I think the, the better, uh, uh, better place for us uh, would, would agree that uh, the marketing got uh, in front of this approval process, but I do appreciate uh, their downsizing the appraisal and attempt to make this a better fit. Um, I is for on some of the concerns that uh, were were mentioned uh, and was responded to in uh, kind by some of the supervisors. The any um, the number of cars are limited to 15. The number of people uh, guests at any time to 30 per day. Uh, visitation by appointment only. Um, no amplified music. That's another issue. I think those folks in the mountains uh, would do appreciate. And it says no candles or open flames. And I guess that gets down to just the bare match stick itself. So I hope that's very clear as well. Um, one thing I, I, I just don't have a good sense of how many uh, scattering sites are anticipated in a three acre area or how many could be there. I, I don't know, it's a, I'm not sure. Um, I think some of the, uh, the residents in the area would would be uh, would like to know that I'd be con I'm concerned about it too. But with the uh, the motion and the recommended amendments to it, I I would be uh, support inclined to support this today. Um, I I do understand the real concerns of timber harvesting. This county uh, has some of the the strictest timber harvesting rules uh, and supervisor years and years to get us there. So I, I want to make sure this is not a, a precedent setting uh, nature of uh, justifications that we're saying in, in, in order to uh, allow this use. But I do want to say that uh, I think with the stipulations that have been put into place and the amendments that have been mentioned, uh, I could be supportive of this project. Uh, this is Supervisor Coonerty. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, I wanted to see if the applicants. Uh, there are two pieces that I heard that I want to make sure I confirm, and then uh, that I that I heard those correctly, and that they could be added as conditions uh, if they're considered friendly to the to the motion. Uh, the first is that um, the the better place for us disclose in their contracts with customers that the forest will be harvested. Um, and I thought I heard uh, them say that, but if they could come back up to the microphone and confirm that. Our contract was updated. Uh, and again, this is a pre-sale agreement to reserve a tree for the future. So the final agreement is, would only be after uh, a permit is issued and it becomes a complete sale. Uh, we have already updated contracts to reflect that this is a working site in working forest land. And as a result, people know that there will be active timber that is part of maintaining and stewarding this property in the future. Sustainable harbor is, harvest is necessary to maintain this forest in the future. But the individual trees that are protected in the conversion areas would not be timber land. So the rest of it would be available for timber. So that would be, just to confirm, that would be consistent. Uh, if we had a condition requiring that, that'd be consistent with what your intention and practice already is. Yes, there's there's already a condition, supervisor, that we would have to uh, uh, submit a timber harvest plan on the property uh, specifically for that so that I think it's, we mentioned seven years from now, the property would be available for timber and that we would perform commercial timber. And then this is, yeah, that was my question for staff is, um, the wording, I believe, is a timber management plan, uh, and then people have said a harvesting plan. 
And if someone on staff could uh, explain the difference between the two and the requ and if there was a requirement that they submit it uh, within two years. The uh, timber management plan is actually a requirement in the general plan. So that is why that has been included in there. So the general plan, when these types of uses are for organized camps are approved, they have to file a timber management plan as well as I can't recall exact, there is a second a condition that was added as well. Timber harvest plan, I believe is a much more detailed plan and Rich Sampson could probably expand on that, but it typically requires a lot more detail about specific trees and I think what is gonna be harvested versus the timber management can really, plan can really be catered to the specific use and the county local jurisdictions can actually decide what it's going to look like. Okay, and then if, is Rich still with us? Yes, I'm still here. So, uh, so. if it, and then I, I guess the question for you is that first question, and the second one, as you mentioned, it's eligible in seven years. When's the soonest they could submit uh, a timber harvesting plan? Um, before that, uh, within that time frame. Maybe let me clarify one thing. There's sure. two things that you mentioned earlier. A timber management plan is is basically a, a plan on how you will manage that. Forest. A timber harvest plan is a specific document that Cal Fire regulates. It's a per permit to harvest. So one is uh, has a whole process of it, including the county helping to review it uh, during the approval process. That would be the timber harvest plan. And the other one is basically just a plan that has no regulatory uh, authority to be followed. It's just this is the plan that they would want to follow. So as far as when's the soonest a timber harvest plan could be submitted, uh, it is 10 years following completion of the previous harvest. Uh, the last plan was a 2014 permit. I believe it was at least 2016 before they completed and I'd have to check my records. So 2026 would be the earliest you could put a, a permit, a timber harvest permit on that property. And do in general, do people submit a couple years in advance or do they, is it, is you don't you don't, you won't take a submission until 2026. Generally, we will look at the permit until it's approved or until it's eligible. Uh, there are, are some times when there's a when, on large properties where there's some units that were harvested um, fairly close to the 10 years. We'll allow the permit to come through, but put a condition that they can't enter that until after the 10 years is up. But more routinely, it, the standard practice in this county is that it's at least 15 years before somebody enters a property again after harvest. Okay, so uh, let me ask County Council, if we put a condition on there that uh, required uh, submission of a timber harvesting plan by 2026, um, would that be consistent with would that be a, an appropriate condition to add to this project? Yes, uh, yes, Supervisor. It would be a, an appropriate condition uh, to add to the project. I would ask the. I would ask two things. Um, first of all, I, I would, in a moment, ask if the applicant uh, would consent to that condition and come to the mic and let us know whether they consent to that condition um, as part of the approval process. I would. I would also want to clear up any kind of confusion with regard to the existing conditions of approval because uh, item 4B indicates that they are to submit a forest management plan and item 4C indicates that they are to submit a timber management plan. And I wanna make sure that, uh, that staff uh, is not indicating that they have to have a forest management plan, a timber management plan, and then a separate timber harvesting plan. I think there's a little confusion around that and that we should clear it up for the record if possible. And there's also D, right? Which is that they have to enter into a binding contract about that timber harvest plan. 
That is actually the other condition that I can recall. Yeah. <laughs> that's in the general plan. So that's why we yeah, included no, I mean, that. That's, that's the conditions of approval here today. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and I would say the timber management plan and forest management plan are really one and the same. So we, we, it was probably by mistake that both were listed. I would say we could do one of them. We do away with one of them. Okay, okay, so can we can we confirm for the record that there is no condition of approval currently in here that's meant to be uh, concerning the timber harvesting plan? There is not right now, no. Okay, so if the board wanted to add that, it would be a fresh condition? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Okay, I so, so if the applicant could come let us know whether they agree to that condition, that would be helpful. Let me, let me ask uh, Wynn for an answer. Yes, we accept that condition. Timber harvest plan submitted by 2026, was that it? Yes, that's what I understood the friendly amendment that was being proposed to be. And so now it would, it would go back to the board. What I'm getting at now with the changes that are being proposed, we're, we've opened this, uh, uh, process up that uh, we need to hear from the uh, opposition. No. Why not? That's not the way it works. Because this is this is just a friendly amendment at this point. The public hearing is closed. This is a, a, fr a friendly amendment that has been uh, has been passed on as uh, regarding the motion. And so now you're in motion territory. Um, so there's there's no more um, there's no more back and forth on presentation. Uh, this is this is uh, Supervisor Coonerty's request to add an additional condition of approval, which any of the board members could do uh, as part of uh, approving or denying this project. Okay, so what we're going to vote on, though, is it won't be final. Well, right now, what what needs to happen is that the maker of the motion, Supervisor Friend, needs to determine whether or not he is amenable to Supervisor Coonerty's. Uh, added condition of approval that the applicant has agreed to. And then he needs to see if Supervisor Leopold as his second agrees to that friendly amendment. And if so, then you would call for the vote. All right. Uh, now this requires a four fifths, a four out of five vote? No, three fifths vote. Three, three, two. Three fifths vote. All right. I, I would just say that I'm, I'm comfortable with the amendment. And as the seconder, uh, council is actually Supervisor uh, Leopold that made the motion and Supervisor Friend made the second, and I'm also comfortable with the second. Thank you for your guidance on that, uh, Mr. Heath. Uh, and just, and I'm sorry, this is uh, Supervisor Coonerty. The, the line, I couldn't tell whether Supervisor Leopold said he was comfortable or uncomfortable, <laughs> which makes a difference, obviously. I agree to the amendment. Okay, thank you. Read, read exactly what we have before us right now. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to put you on that because I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Well, you want me to try? So um, I made the motion to, to, to uh, use the conditions of approval uh, and the findings that are here for approval that are in attachment A. All right that uh, we are gonna ask for um, a general panel language to make sure that this can happen again in TPZ. We are gonna ask staff to uh, come up with um, where the spreading of cremated remains could happen in Santa Cruz uh, and whether there needs to be any additional regulation around that. Uh, and that the, uh, the Better Place Forests will be required to submit a timber harvest plan by 2026 um, uh, to Cal Fire. And then the other conditions of approval is they, they've got to do it and have a, all the pieces together. So, but basically yeah. when, uh, a yes vote on this is saying that they can go ahead. Correct. And a no vote means no. Correct. There, there, currently, there, yeah. currently the way the rules that we have, it's a no. 
but we're changing it to a yes. No, that's not accurate. Uh, there, there, it's up to your board to determine whether the use is appropriate. That's, uh, it's not a yes or no answer uh, across the board. Um, you get to decide that here in this hearing today. Um, the, the, the last thing I will, I will point out is that Supervisor Coonerty had one additional uh, request, which is that the um, language regarding the timber harvesting be placed in the contracts. And I believe uh, that was part of the motion as well. Supervisor Leopold? Correct. Uh, and uh, how many acres are we talking about here? Uh, how many acres in the t in the TP how zone many district? Acres are so affected by this. So they they are applying the modification of the proposal was to restrict the memorial forest where they would put the cremated remains in a less than three acre conversion permit. So it'd be less than three acres, and they are. Distinct, they're in specific polygon areas. The map of polygons was submitted to your board to illustrate where they plan to have the memorial trees. And it's the addition of all the polygon areas in addition to the improvements, like the non-habitable structure, the other roadway improvements, total uh, less than three acres total. It's it, The sum total of all that area is less than three acres. The site itself is an 84 acre site. However, about eight acres is special use. So that leaves about 76 acres of TP zone. So if you recall, the site has two zone districts on it. Most of it is TP, 76 acres is zone TP. So with minus the three acres, about three acres, for the conversion exemption, 73 acres would be left for okay. timber harvest. Okay. All right. Uh, we have no more questions. Uh, I, and we can't open it up anymore. So uh, I have to call for the public hearing is now closed. I bring it back to the board. I guess we'll need a uh, motion and a second. So the motion has been made by myself and then supervisor friend has, has uh, seconded the motion. There's been some, uh, with some uh, friendly amendments and I believe we're ready to vote. And I, I think we have to. Okay, yeah. I'll call the roll. Uh, no, supervisor, I, ready? Uh, County council, we're ready to vote, right? Absolutely. Uh, like, no more comment. No more comment. No more. no more comment. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chairman Caput? No. So uh, the motion passes four to one. Okay. One more item, I think, or two more items. We have two more. Uh, anybody that spoke on uh, item number 10 earlier this morning, uh, you will not be able to speak on it again. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, let me go back to item number 10. Uh, consider adoption of an urgency ordinance uh, adding chapter 7.109 to the Santa Cruz County Code to provide remedies for violation of public health orders as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And that's better known as masks. And do we need a staff, uh, are we gonna have a report on it? Yes, I was gonna ask if our county council could describe the ordinance to the board. Sure. Thank you. Sure, this, this, is a, this is an ordinance designed to put a new tool in our, in our tool basket. Right now, violation of public health officer orders are classified as misdemeanors, which lead to large penalties, uh, such as six months in jail and uh, and $1,000 fines. What we were looking for is a uh, something that is broader in scope, that is uh, that, that gives us an ability 
to speak with people, uh, to publicly educate folks and, uh, and ask them to comply voluntarily before giving them something akin to a traffic ticket if they refuse to comply. We believe that it's better for law enforcement and for our existing county staff, our administrative staff like planning, uh, code enforcement folks, environmental health, to be able to have uh, this as an enforcement tool. Uh, of course, nobody wants to issue tickets. What we wanna do is we wanna obtain voluntary compliance by educating people and asking them for their cooperation. But if folks uh, aren't willing to go there with us, we have to have some kind of an ability to uh, have an enforcement mechanism. This would allow law enforcement to write a ticket that would be handled in traffic court like any other violation of the county code, or it would allow designated staff to issue administrative penalty citations that would also be subject to appeal. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. Okay. Uh, so even if somebody doesn't like to wear a mask, actually, this is better for them anyway. I mean, it's, uh, with the current way we are, they would have to go before a judge. Yeah, well, well, and what we're saying now is you have something like a parking ticket that you have to take care of. That's a great way of explaining it. Yes. All right. Okay. Anyway, does uh, anybody here in the chambers like to speak on item number 10? Uh, go ahead. Chair, excuse yeah. are we doing two minutes or three minutes? Uh, can you do it in two minutes? <laughs> go ahead. Was that from what I read? Uh, the first citation was 100, then it was 200, then it was 500. But when you go through the system as a, as a traffic situation, the, basically the, the penalty triples. But I don't know if that's what's really important here. What is really going on with wearing these masks when there's been so much information that this is just a hoax and it doesn't do anything except to say that I am going to blindly follow rules that are basically based on uh, nonsense. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a pandemic going on. You know, when there's 400 bioweapons labs in the United States alone, there's thousands of bioweapons available. But there's lots of different ways to cause harm. So by one, not actually introducing to the public what actually I believe I read about what was going on about here as far as the penalties and then providing information what that actually means. I don't know what kind of service is really being offered. Uh, it seems like there are many other issues going on that are just getting swept under the rug. And I wish I had more time to go into detail about that. And I will at, a, at another time. So once again, I'm glad that we are able to stand up here and speak. And I appreciate that because I don't know any other jurisdictions in the county where you can do that. So that's enough. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Drew Lewis. I'd like to encourage the board to vote no on a new health officer order of item 10. I respectfully request that you vote no on this new order of the health officer. The request for the new ordinance with severe penalties is based on evidence that I believe comes from fraudulent and contrived data. I would address evidence uh, for uh, fraudulent and, and contrived data for profit and monetary gain. The false, positive the false positive tests for COVID-19 average around 50% according to many studies. False recording of people being positive because COVID-19 tests commonly used was said by its creator, Nobel Prize winner, Carrie Mullis, quote, must not be used to diagnose an infectious disease, unquote. There are monetary incentives to hospitals to falsely record positive tests and death certificates for financial gain. $13,000 for every death certificate with COVID-19 on it. They get $39,000 for every patient who dies on a ventilator who has COVID-19 on their death certificate. They also get $150,000 to $300,000 for each COVID-19 patient who dies in a hospital. According to the Washington Examiner, Quote, the CDC director acknowledges hospitals have a monetary incentive to overcount coronavirus deaths. 
Other countries oppose lockdowns, mass and social distancing. Sweden and Netherlands have officially declared that, science, that the science does not support a lockdown, mass and social distancing, and they do, will not force these useless and extreme measures on their people. There is clear evidence of fraud and contrived fear are being used to manipulate us all for the profit and personal gain. I think that the, uh, the health director said that the, anyway, there's a tsunami of workers and their families who will soon become homeless and destitute as a result of supporting these lies and fraud for profit. Thank you. So I've been waiting in these chambers three hours today to speak to this. Could I please have three minutes? I've been waiting for three hours in this chamber today to speak to this issue. Could I please have three minutes as everybody in oral communications did? No. Thank you very much. Bruce Tanner. So we're now being asked to accept that this pandemic is going to go on into the indefinite future based on what the public media, the commercial media are saying, which seems to be what's driving all of the policy in this county and in the state. And this is not based on the science, although you claim repeatedly that it is. All of the science shows that the new cases which were being assured are rocketing up are based on these very scientific tests, but they're not. These tests have been conceded by the federal agencies actually to be inconclusive and have a lot of false positives. So also, if we have all of these extra cases, the more cases there are, the less fatal this supposed pandemic is. And we are approaching some kind of herd immu immunity as the human immune system has done throughout our history of hundreds of thousands of years on this planet. Nonetheless, now we want to have new laws to extract revenue from the people of this county based on their not complying with these specious orders. The masks do not have any scientific studies that show that they stop transmission. In fact, it's very questionable as to whether they do at all. They're, they don't have anything that proves that. And there are many scientific studies that prove that wearing these masks is bad for human health and damages the immune system. But, but we're not following that. So I'd just like to remind you that in passing these ordinances, you are acting under color of law and you're passing an ordinance which is void in advance of its being passed because it violates the constitutional rights of the people of this county. And you're violating your own oaths of office. And the officers who are gonna be asked to enforce this are violating their oaths of office as well in, in, in enforcing a law, supposed law that's passed under color of law. And I hope that the public of this county understands that these laws are illegitimate and the county does not have the jurisdiction to extract the revenue of people of this county from, for obeying, submitting to these laws which are not based on any f solid practice and violate our right to behave as we would prefer. Yeah, hi, my name is Rich Buckingham. I'd like to uh, point out that uh, while this COVID-19 vi uh, virus is, is infectious, it's not very deadly. And as such, I don't see an argument for shutting things down and having masks. Uh, I'd like to point out that, for example, if you get a uh, vaccination or you have cancer, your immune system may or may not develop antibodies which are detected by this test which is, it, it doesn't tell you whether you're sick or not. It tells you whether, it tells doctors whether you have antibodies and it, this doesn't indicate disease. And now as far as mask goes, uh, when you have a mask on, you're breathing in excess CO2 
and you're not getting an, enough oxygen. And um, CO2 is good for plants. Uh, however, it's not good for humans. It's a, it's a waste product. And um, some people will tell you that the, the results of wearing masks are more dangerous than, than, dangerous than COVID-19. And finally, if there's a second wave of this so-called virus, it might be the result of people getting sick from carbon dioxide poisoning and, and hypoxia, which is lack of oxygen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. Hi. It's a shame we didn't get to speak this morning. There were more people who were here, would have taken about 15 minutes. Anyway, I was in this room in 2011 and 2012 when there was a, another type of urgency ordinance pass, uh, an ordinance that was extended. And I think some of the comments of the health officer then, Dr. Namcom, is relevant here. This was about health risks associated with smart meters and a ordinance the county had to prevent installation. She states there's no uh, scientific data to determine a safe level of radio frequency microwave radiation. Then she says, the question for government agency is that given the evidence of existing and potential harm, should we err on the side of safety and take the precautionary avoidance measure? This case from microwave radiation that's known, the two unique features of exposure are universal exposure and involuntary exposure due to this already ubiquitous saturation, saturation of infrastructure in Santa Cruz County. Government agencies for protecting public health and safety and should be much more vigilant about involuntary environmental exposure because governmental agencies are the only defense against this involuntary exposure to the microwave radiation. Now in this case, in this ordinance, unfortunately to stop PG&E and their agency Wellington was not in force. And today we have more and more radiation and infrastructure and damage. Um, masks are unhealthy. Vaccines that are, you're leading to uh, mandatory vaccines next, the Supreme Court decision, I forget what year it was, said vaccines are inherently unsafe. And this is to dictate harm on the community instead of protecting the community is not what government agencies should do. Now, we also know there are chemicals found in babies' umbilical cords, industrial chemicals by the hundreds. Trace. Contact tracing, we know those chemicals come from industry. To protect children, that's what should be banned. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, this is Ellie again. So here we are, and I feel like I'm on the crazy train. Still, still, here we are. We're talking about potentially fining people in a community where we're looking at many people are now on public aid, including myself, for the first time in their lives. And we're talking about fining people? Are we crazy? Hello? Hello? Think about this for a second. Meanwhile, how many people in this room are aware that in Europe, tens of thousands of people have been marching against mask mandates? Tens of thousands of people. What, you got like, we have like, what, a couple hundred people in Santa Cruz who have been talking about this openly? I'm talking tens of thousands of people. Have you seen the pictures? Entire streets. It looked to me like half a mile filled with people. Okay, so this is not just a couple of Santa, keep Santa Cruz weird people who are talking about this. This is a lot of people all over the planet. These are doctors who are saying these things. 
So to even consider, to even consider, oh, we're gonna fine you for something that is being protested around the world with very real considerations being brought to the forefront by medical professionals is insane. To have politicians making this type of decision on a health topic is nuts, okay? We need to get our jobs back, we need to actually build our economy so we can actually afford to pay these fines. So please vote no on this, it's nuts. Do something that actually helps the community. Figure out how we can get back to work, how we can get our kids back in school so we can actually get back to work and build the economy. Get our community gardens open. Actually make sure we have food security in the coming, in the coming months. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, is, there any, uh, is there anyone down in the uh, community room? No, we have There's no one in the community room. Any web comments? So chair, we do have web comments. We have 12 emails, but of those emails, it's a total of six people. Four of them are against this ordinance and two are for it. There's, they're not saying anything that hasn't already been said in this room. I can just give you that information or I can read them into the record for you. It's, they will be attached to the minutes. It's up to you. Okay. Please read the email. Uh, can you speak louder? Speak louder, please. Chair, Did I make a comment? No. 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 Chair, it's it's up to, it's up to you. The clerk has the clerk has, has has offered you a recommendation that there are it sounds like twelve uh, emails that could be read into the record right now, or in the interest of time, you could accept the representation that the clerk has made that there are four uh, uh, in against the or, ordinance and two that are in favor of the ordinance right. and those emails will be attached to the minutes and will be attached to the record of these proceedings. You can yeah. choose okay. as chair uh, to accept yes. that if you'd like. Okay. Yes, you'd like me to read them or yes, we're good with the yeah, description. Read them. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, you're gonna read all of them? I, if you want me to read them, I would read all of them. Otherwise we can just go off the description I just gave you. Them? She's not gonna, she's summarizing them as that four against two right. or four. Right. So she's, she's suggesting that, that, that she'll put them in the record. You don't, she doesn't need to read them unless you want her to read them. The, the four that are against is everything that has already been said. And the two that are for is pretty much everything that has already been said. All right, <laughs> all right go ahead. You would like me to read all of them? Some of these are very long and people sent multiple emails. Well, so I only get one shot at that. I know, so I'm gonna um, set the timer on myself. So if you'll be, bear with me, it will take a little bit of time. The first one is from Adam, Adam Novak. I think this is a good idea. The inf an infraction is the right level of severity to use here. Although it would be good to income index the fine somehow. One of the public comments complained that this was a criminalization, non criminalizing non criminals. There is no such thing as criminals and non criminals, just people doing what they think they need to do and government declaring various things to be crimes, or in this case, infractions. He goes on to say, one of the other commentators did have a point though. How are we going to make mask ordinance work for deaf people who need to read lips? There could be an exemption for when you are trying to communicate with such a person but you can't tell a deaf person just by looking at them and it doesn't seem right for them to have to notify everyone that they want to talk. The next comment is from Satay O'Ryan. I am deeply troubled that you are considering this action to codify additional fines for violations of public health orders which currently would relate to the wearing of face coverings and social distancing, as well as authorizing additional enforcers. I am not attending the meeting today because I'm unable to wear a face mask due to my inability to breathe. You do not, you do not provide adequate opportunity for those who have medical exemptions to share in public. Why are you not allowing the public to phone in their comments during the meeting? She goes on to say, I take no issue with the phone following public health orders when such orders are legitimate and backed by scientific evidence. 
in the case of the current face covering and social distancing orders, this is not the case. I have sent abundant scientific evidence to the Board of Supervisors and Dr. Newell proving the ineffectiveness of face masks. One of these emails is included in the agenda packet. I've also questioned the legitimacy of continuing the current local emergency, asked for documentation justification and received no reply. She continues, the University of Minnesota Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy published an, an article by Dr. Brosu and Dr. Setsema, both experts on respiratory infection and infectious diseases. They state that in sum, given, I'm sorry, in sum, given the information about their performance as source control in real world settings, along with extremely low efficiency of cloth masks as filters and their poor fit, there is no evidence to support their use by the public or healthcare workers to control emission of particles from the wearer. They further state, we do not recommend requiring the general public who do not have any symptoms of COVID-19 like illness to routinely wear cloth or surgical masks. She sent in three more emails that I won't read. The next one is by Gail Marie McNulty. Sad to see racism and selfishness being expressed so openly at this morning's meeting. It's easy for those who are able to shelter in place and choose how seriously or not seriously they take their own safety. It's heartless for these same people to put those who are less fortunate at risk and to pretend that those who are safe now have somehow earned the safety and the privilege that allows them to put others at risk is to stay blind to the injustice that has lived in this county since white supremacist slave and conquest funding. The propaganda being so widely spread in this country are, is, is just that. Our future safety, well-being, and democratic freedom depend on dismantling false truths and electing leaders who have the courage to take bold positions and defend truth, equality, and justice. While we must demilitarize our police and begin a restorative justice process to ensure less brutality and more safety and, equi and equi equity, giving up measures designed to protect our most vulnerable citizens from a potentially deadly pandemic is not the place to start. Next one is from Kevin, um, Ken Davenport. I generally agree with compliances to health mandates. However, this proposal is too broad. What, code enforce, what is a code enforcement officer? Are they police? Do they carry guns or wear a uniform? Are they driving around neighborhoods looking for family barbecues? Will all the protests related to Black Lives Matter is going to further alienate government from the people they serve. The public wants to know the details of how you plan to administer this proposal. The next one, uh, there is no name given. Your decision today will determine if you are listening to your voters. Ticketing people for not wearing a mask goes against people's right to choose. A cloth mask is no more than a pollution shield. Blocking viral particles require medical grade PPE. Wearing a mask at a desk is 100% different than wearing a mask while exercising. While neither are effective at protecting you from your viral particles, your decision to ticket, for example, a runner for not wearing a mask while they are attempting to stay healthy is a huge abuse of elected positions. Um, no mask, ma listen to your constituents, no mask mandate. We are watching and will vote accordingly in November elections. Next one is from Becky Steinbrenner. <coughs> Dear Board of Supervisors, please do not pass this punitive ordinance that would cause a chilling impact to personal and medical freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution to the general public. Those with medical exemptions to wearing a face mask would be harassed by law enforcement for simply taking care of their health. I have personally experienced this problem in your board chambers multiple times when I had a note from a physician recommending that I use a face shield, not a mask due to health risk. Your board muted me when I did not wear a mask and the sheriff deputy cleared the chambers when I wore my facial shield instead of a mask. I presented my physician note to him, but he rejected it. This morning when I attempted to participate from home on item number five, public comment, my com comments were not read. How can you in good conscience adopt a punitive 
measure that would find people like myself for not wearing face masks, even though it is potentially harmful to our health. Please do not adopt any ordinance that would fine anyone for not following the health and safety guidelines issued by Governor Newsom. These rules change daily and the public has no way to be kept, kept appraised of the whims that are not supported by solid peer reviewed science. Who would be your enforcers, the sheriff or a person in the community who wants to make my life miserable and call the county hotline to report me and others with medical exemptions? Can you really justify spending more precious taxpayer money to hire extra enforcers? Who, as we saw initially with the overzealous sheriff deputies hired to enforce shelter and place orders, just really did not understand the intent of the order and caused a lot of fear and anger in the community. And that's all of them now. Becky Steingrutner sent one in. I didn't hear it. Was I just in. read it, Marilyn. Okay, it's hard to hear you. <laughs> that's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll bring it back to the board for uh, uh, comments. Uh, any comments? Yes. No. Chair, uh, the, the, in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we've uh, had to ask people to do lots of things that they're not used to doing because we're trying to spread the, uh, this, uh, we're trying to slow the spread of this virus in our community, which has had an impact. That impact is real. Um, yeah, there are the, over a thousand people who've contracted uh, this uh, virus. There are hundreds of people who have ended up in the hospital. And unfortunately there's four people who've died. Um, this uh, new ordinance actually is just another way of doing something that's already been in place which is it was already a misdemeanor not to wear your mask. There wasn't uh, the, uh, the method in which uh, uh, that had to be enforced uh, wasn't as effective as this method. Um, and so I'm gonna be supporting this uh, ordinance. I also wanna point out that you can't pick and choose when to listen to public health leaders. If you stand in front of us and say that the public health leader was right in 2011, but and somehow the public health leader in 2020 is not, that's, you, you don't get to pick and choose. You know, we're following the advice. We did follow the advice actually from um, the health officer in 2011, and we are following the advice of our health officer in 2020. So I would move the recommended actions. Okay. Uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second or any other comments? Second, Coonerty. Thank you, I'll do the roll call. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Sorry, aye. <laughs> Supervisor McPherson. Aye. Chair Caput. Aye. Motion passes unanimously and that takes us to item number 11. And uh, this one is consider the final appointment of Emily Bali the first five commission as an at-large representative for a term to expire April 1st, 2023. I move approval. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. Did you, we get I'll the call, call the roll. Was that Supervisor right. Friend who seconded? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think so, yeah. I believe so. We'll see if there's anybody from the public who wants to say anything. Public? Okay. Seeing none. Any, uh, any comments from the public? Uh, we'll take it to a vote. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Chairman Caput. Aye. Passes unanimously. And that concludes today's agenda. What we'll do is we will have a special meeting, revised budget hearing starting August 10th through the 13th. 2020 at uh, 9 a.m. and August 18th, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. Regular meeting, August 18th at 9 a.m. Thank you.